Congratulations on your purchase of a Triton Work Centre. We believe you've bought the best value for money woodworking machine anywhere. And if you set the machine up properly and look after it, it will look after you for years to come. This videotape is being made in June 1984. Now it is possible that the machine you have is somewhat different in detail to this machine here. If it is, all you have to do is follow the, the instruction book that came with the machine in conjunction with the video and you should have no problem because the basic concepts are the same. Now we as a company have a policy that whenever we upgrade our machines we try to make the new parts and the accessories adaptable to earlier models. If you have got an earlier model than the one shown here, then why don't you write into us, give us your name, address, phone number and the serial number of the machine. Our address and phone number are printed on the rear panel of the machine. Write in, tell us what model you've got or what the serial number is and we'll send you out a bulletin on how you can upgrade your machine. If properly set up, your Triton will be capable of phenomenal accuracy. However, as you'll see from the test cut section and the troubleshooter's guide, the quality of your cuts depends to a certain extent on the quality of the saw and router you fitted and the quality of your blades and bits. If you're considering upgrading any of your power tools or cutters, have a look at those sections first before making a buying decision. Unless you're a very competent woodworker, we do suggest it's a very good idea to work through this video and actually perform the cuts as shown. Now, of course, you won't be very popular if you start doing that in the lounge room. So there's a couple of ways around it. Firstly, if your equipment's fairly portable, take it out into the workshop with you. With some precautions, you won't have any problem. For starters, don't handle your video cassettes in the workshop environment. You might get dust on the cassette, and as you know, that can damage your heads, can clog them up. So put a board over the top of your cassette machine, a couple of spacing pieces so you get lots of airflow through there, and you may even want to drape some clear plastic over the top. You can use your shuttle, your remote control, to shuttle backwards and forwards. As far as your TV set goes, just a towel and a spacing piece, just to get a bit of airflow under there, that should keep it from getting any dust inside, and that's okay. If you're not prepared to move your, your equipment out into the workshop, what you can do is this. Perhaps move your VCR and your TV set around so that it's right up against the window on the inside of the house, uh, preferably next to your driveway, so that you can work outside in the driveway. You can hear the volume through a partially open window, use your remote control to shuffle backwards and forwards, and just view the picture through the window and work that way. But it is a very good idea unless you're quite competent already, to work through the video doing all the cuts you think you might come across in the course of your woodworking. If you've bought the folding stand, then assemble that first. Now there are about 14 wrong ways of assembling the stand. There's only one right way, so get it right. These two long tubes have the collared rivets in line with each other. You'll notice they are closer to this end than the other end. Okay, bear that in mind. Put the two tubes about 14 inches or 350 mil apart. Two of your legs have two straps, two of them have only a single strap. Take the one with two straps, turn that up, turn that up, and place it in position like so, and bring this strap across to this side. Take the other strap, the other leg with two straps, put that into position, and again swing the strap over. You'll notice the relative position of the stud and the strap here. Take the hex headed self tappers, use a ring spanner on these so you can push down on the self tapper as you're tightening it, line up the three holes and uh, fit the self tapper. You'll find it's a little bit difficult to get it started but once you have got it started it'll go in quite easily. And put one of the self tappers in there, nip it up quite firmly and then put the other one in here. Take a roofing bolt, a washer and a nut, place it through this cross brace, washer underneath and the lock nut and finger tighten only, don't span or tighten it at this stage. Now flip the whole stand over, like so. Turn these two brackets upwards and take your remaining two legs Put this one in here and bring that strap across. Put this one in this bracket and bring that strap across and put your remaining two self-tappers in there and in there and tighten. 
fit the other roofing vault washer and nut. Again, don't tighten it. And then take your whole stand and erect it. Now you just open those two legs, open those two, and bring these hooked straps down over the collared rivets, give them a sharp hit. You may have to find, if they're a little bit tight, you may have to remove a little bit of the paint from the hooked strap. But your stand is now ready to plug the work centre into. Lay out the contents of the large fasteners bag. Don't unpack the saw clamps as yet. You'll need them later on. Lay out all the other contents and just check that you've got everything. And with these, if you've got 12 of these hex-headed uh, bolts, uh, put the washers over the heads of them. Now take the long base tubes and fit a spacer at the end of each one. You may have to give it a bit of persuasion. You may have to tap, tap it into position. And... Uh, Put one of those in the corner of each of your base tubes, like so. They'll stop the tube from collapsing when you tighten the bolt. Then take an end panel, put it upside down on, the, on your workbench. Take one of these bolts, the coach bolts, put it through the spacer. Lift it into position, put a 5 16th washer on and one of the 5 16th nuts. Finger tighten only at this stage and repeat that at the other three corners of the machine. And then turn the whole chassis over and stand, stand it on your bench. Don't worry about squaring it up yet. Then take your aluminium channels. The cutout in the top of the channel must be facing upwards. I'll turn it around this way so you can see what's happening. And if your machine has corner brackets like this, with the cutouts upwards, they face downwards. Take one of your hex bolts with the washer under the, under the head and put it through this hole here, the inside hole. Turn it over, drop a star washer, one of those little star washers, over the bolt, and then a hexagon nut, and again just finger tighten. The purpose of that star washer is to dig into the nut so that it'll stop the nut from turning when you're spanner tightening later on. And prepare both of your alum aluminium channels to this stage with a bracket at each end. Having prepared the channels to this point, it's a very easy matter to angle them into the machine and sit them in position and then insert another bolt and washer through this hole here, another one down there, and the same at the other end and on the other side. Fit one of the star washers on the inside and a hex nut at each of the other eight points. This is the front of the machine. The panel which has a switch on it is the front, and when we talk about the front, that's the end we mean. Now take the table, the holes labeled WR should be towards the back panel, so that the holes labeled R at this end are closest to the front panel, the switch end, and put the table on top with the locating studs in the back panel going into the holes labeled WR. Push that in, drop it down. Now, the locking keys from the large bag of fasteners go through these holes into the holes labeled R and a quarter turn to fasten. If you find that the locking pins are a bit of a tight fit, it could be due to excess paint buildup. Don't use a drill to open those holes up. Use a file or a scraper if you have to. When you've got the locking pins in, just push the whole thing together, make sure it's all nice and snug, and then you can take your spanner and start tightening up these 12 bolts on top, tightening from the outside, and if necessary, holding with a spanner on the inside in case the star washer isn't doing its job properly. If one or more of the bolts uh, refuse to tighten properly, then remove the tabletop, take a large screwdriver, slide it in carefully as a wedge under the nut, try not to damage the channel, and then you can easily tighten from the outside. There's one or two remaining, or you may prefer to use some long nose pliers to grab the nut. Now take this spanner and loosen off the four knobs holding the table rail adjusters, and set your table rail height to the following settings. If you have a six and a quarter inch saw, set it so at this top edge here
is opposite 44 millimeters. Now each of these calibrations is two millimeters. Six and a quarter is 44, seven and a quarter is 56, eight and a quarter is 68, nine and a quarter inch saw is 80 millimeters, and a 10 and a quarter is 92 millimeters. So I'll be fitting a seven and a quarter inch saw, set it on 56 mil and 56 mil there, and the same at the back. And then take the locking pins and just see if they'll fit comfortably through those holes. You may have some paintwork problems, again, or you may have to loosen these knobs and move the rail sideways slightly. Okay, then half pull them out, and you're just about ready to fit your table. Use a spanner to lightly nip these knobs up at all four points. Now, don't be too finicky at this point. You still have to fine tune these settings in the test cut sections. So just nip them up at the recommended positions. Take the table so that the T-shaped holes are closest towards the back panel of the machine and simply slide it in, resting it on these two rails, slide it in sideways until the rear studs go into these unlabeled holes. They're marked but not labeled and the locking keys will then go into the holes labeled D. D of course stands for docking. Quarter turn to fasten and just make sure everything's pushed up home there's a nice even fit. Pick up the work centre and put it on the floor so that the back panel is resting on the floor. And take a spanner and now you can tighten these four, four nuts here and tighten them quite firmly, top and bottom. And then you can fit the four rubber feet. Now it's very important that you fit, fit the rubber feet the right way. The chamfer on the foot must face away from the machine. And you simply screw it on like this. And as a double check, make sure that the nut in the bottom of the rubber foot is still visible. If you can't see that nut, you've got the rubber foot on the wrong way. Erect the folding stand on the floor and make sure these two free ends are basically vertical. And note that this is a braced end. Take the work center and Here's a hint, it'll help you when fitting the work centre to the stand if you remove the tabletop. Makes it easier to lift and gives you better visibility. But lift up the work centre, locate the two rubber feet on the braced end first and just rest them there. Go around the free end, line the tubes up with the rubber feet and plug in. And then go around the braced end and plug that in nice and firmly. Now you can tighten the bolt and nut through the cross braces. Tighten them at both ends and your stand and work centre are assembled. To remove and refit the work centre from the stand, you simply place your foot in the corner of the brace there and lift straight up. If you find your rubber feet are a little bit too tight, then two things we can suggest. Firstly, try some lubricant, a bit of spray lubricant like RP7 or WD40 on the rubber feet. Might make it easier. Or you may have done the rubber feet up too tight and swollen them slightly, so perhaps loosen them off a fraction. If they're too loose, then just tighten the rubber foot up a little bit and it should be a nice tight, a nice snug fit. If the floor of your workshop is slightly uneven, you may find the Triton is rocking very slightly. There is a fairly simple solution. Try this. Lift one end of the work centre and bang it down quite firmly on the ground. And perhaps try the same at the other end and see if that cures the problem. Otherwise, by pushing the work centre at the, one of the end panels, you can generally bed it down to slight irregularities in your floor. Take the work stops and notice that one of them has a notch in it. The one with the notch goes on the left hand side of the machine if you're standing at the front panel. Put in the T-shaped holes. Now the way to fit the work stops is to push them fairly low down with your fingers or thumbs and push them hard home. They should be quite a firm fit but if you notice that one of them won't quite go home then take a Phillips head screwdriver and very slightly, slightly loosen off that bolt. Just very slightly less than a quarter of a turn, push it home, and then when it is home, you can nip up that bolt again. Don't, under any circumstances, fully remove those bolts and let those nylon lug lugs drop off. They're very difficult to replace if you do happen to take them off. Take the protractor and fit it in this slot here, and check the slide action. Check it all the way through. Remove this work stop. Check the slide action all the way through. Now, if the slide is a little bit tight, what you should do is get some spray lubricant, again, RP7, WD40, they're all much the same, and spray a little bit on the strip, and uh, then try it again. That should improve the problem. If it's still a little bit tight at some points, then what you have to do 
is get a file and remove a little bit of paint from the side of the slot, perhaps on both sides. After you've removed a bit of paint, wipe it off, re-lubricate and check it again. And keep doing that until you've got a very smooth, even slide all the way along. Now let's say the protractor is a little bit sloppy in the slot, which it may be. There's a way of re rectifying that. Remove the strip from your protractor, put it down on a flat, hard surface, and get a bit of half inch rod, for example, or even 10 millimeter, 3 8 put it on the strip, and use a hammer, and that will spread the strip very slightly, hit it a few times, put it back in the slot and try it, and keep going until you've got a perfect, smooth slide. Here's a useful hint. Notice how the calibration scale has been highlighted. Very simply, get some paint, preferably white plastic paint, paint it all over the calibrations, and as it's drying off, get a moist rag and just wipe off the excess. It'll bring the calibrations out nice and prominent. Have the mitre gauge in the slot with the aluminium strip pointing towards the back panel. Loosen this knob off several turns and push it down. It may be quite tight and turn the locking head through 90 degrees and then tighten up the knob and that should lock the protractor firmly in the slot and you can test it by pushing it and see if it moves. Now you can set any angle you wish, say 45 degrees, lock it, lock both wing nut and knob and that's ready for a mitre cut. Take the slide plate and with this flap pointing upwards, sit it on the bearing channels. The main centre slot in the slide plate should be directly above the centre slot in the table. Now, slide it to one end, those two bearings should drop down. Slide it back the other end and those two bearings should drop down. And check the slide action. Now it, now it will probably be a little bit tight. Before doing anything else, get some spray lubricant, RP7, WD40, CRC, they're all much the same. Just spray the open faces of both channels. And there. And then check the slide action. That should free it up considerably. If it's still a little bit tight, especially towards the end, then have a close look at the end panels and see that those edges aren't dented in at all four points. Have a close look at the corners of the slide plate. Make sure they're not dented in or dented out. If it's a bit tight, try and find out whether it's pushing outwards against the channels or pulling inwards against them. And you may have to slightly bend that edge in or out a little bit. Or if that one's a faulty edge, bend that in or out very slightly until you've got a nice even slide. But that's very important. It must slide freely from end to end. Let's say when you drop your bearings down into the, cu the cutouts, one or more of them didn't go down flat. And so this is a result, you can't pull the saw back. Try pushing down a little bit harder, and that may straighten it up. Or, if necessary, take a spanner and a screwdriver and loosen the tension on the offending bearing, bearing just slightly. You should be able to turn the bearings comfortably by hand. Just loosen it off if necessary so that when you drop it in, it sits down flat and you can pull the slide plate all the way back. If your work centre came complete with this template, then off the back, find out which hole positions to drill for your particular saw and then following the instructions very carefully on the front here, use the template as directed to find your approximate hole positions. Now you will have to check them before drilling your holes, but this will put you roughly in the right spot. Take a thin sheet of material with one straight edge. Now you can use cardboard, but preferably sheet metal or plastic, something fairly thin, and put it on your slide plate, lining it up with the innermost of these, two, of these marks. The innermost marks, just line it up with them, and then tape it in position. Very simply like this. And at the other end. And that'll give you a reference point to line your saw blade up with. That's why sheet metal is better, because it won't flex. Take your portable saw and check that the wing nut at the front is set at zero. Now, you may have to adjust that slightly, but set it nominally at zero for the moment. Also check that your saw blade is at full depth all the way, no obstructions there. And then take a rubber band or a bit of wire and tie back the safety guard, just like this. You don't use the safety guard on the Triton, but whatever you do, don't remove that guard. Because if you do, there may come a day when you'll want to use your saw handheld, and if you've taken that safety guard off, you'll have a very lethal instrument in your hands. So don't take the guard off, but you may tie it back with a bit of wire when you finish working for the day, of course, release the rubber band or the wire so that the safety guard spring does not fatigue. 
don't keep it tied back indefinitely. Take the power saw and with the front of the saw facing the back of the triton, put it on the slide plate with the saw blade just touching against the cardboard or sheet metal strip which you've taped down. Move the slide plate until it reaches the end of its travel against the rear panel and then slide the saw forwards or backwards until the bottom of the blade is just level with the vertical face of the work stops. Just level there. Make sure the saw blade is touching gently against that edge and then take a marker pen and mark the four corners of your saw to give you a permanent location for future reference. Unpack the small bag of saw clamping brackets and get the lower clamps, which are the shallow ones, and put them against the edge of your, edge of your saw and put the top clamp on top and just make sure you've got four positions around the base of your saw to put a lower and an upper clamp. Try to, if possible, aim for the very corners of the saw as close to the edge as you can and uh, also try to dodge any obstructions on the saw base. Now, if you've got an obstruction right in an inconvenient spot, don't hesitate to modify the top, cl top clamp slightly, hacksaw a little piece out of it or file a bit off it, it'll still do its job. Once you've selected the four positions for your lower saw clamps, push them hard against the edge of the saw and then get a sharp pencil and mark on the slide plate the outline of the oval adjustment slot at each of the four points. Then you can remove your clamps, remove your saw, remove that strip and take a center punch, preferably remove the slide plate from the triton for this operation, take a center punch and mark the exact center of that adjustment slot. Mark that with a hammer and punch and then drill four holes. Now the hole sizes should be quarter inch, about 6.4 millimeters, or slightly oversized. Drill four holes at each of those points, right in the center of the adjustment slot. And here's another tip. When you've drilled the holes, don't deburr them. The burrs will help stop these bolts from turning when you're tightening the nuts. Another way to stop the bolts from turning is to place a star washer over each of the bolts, feed them up from underneath. That star washer will dig in with the burr, and then drop a flat washer on, another star washer, and the hex nut, and finger tighten only. These four clamps should only be finger tight at this point, and lined up roughly with the four marks you've made at the corners of your saw. Okay, now put the saw back in position between the four saw clamps, and line it up with the marks you've made on the slide plate, and fit the top clamps. Now, you can quite easily, comfortably angle the clamps if necessary, or modify them as described earlier. Then put a flat washer on, a, spring, a coil spring washer, and the wing nut. Now here's an interesting situation. The wing nut is hard to tighten. Very simply, raise the saw like that, tighten the wing nut, and finger tighten at the four points, putting the top clamps on. Your saw is now in approximately the right position, but you have to true it up still. And to do it, you do it in the rip saw mode. There's a good procedure which you should follow for converting from docking to ripping and do it every time the same way and you'll avoid problems. Firstly, slide the plate to the end of its travel and use a finger hole in the plate to lift the front two bearings out. Now that will get your saw blade up out of the slot in the table so you can now slide the table out without running the risk of your teeth putting a deep scratch mark across the paintwork. Unlock the table, pull it off the rear pins and slide it out. Rest it on the ground. The power cord can be tucked in behind there. And then taking the finger hole, move it towards the back panel and just flip the plate over like this and drop those two bearings in the front of the machine and try to centralize this as much as possible between the two end panels. Try to centralize the plate. Then get your table and turn it around so that the T-shaped holes where the work stops go are closest to the front of the machine. The back panel rivets will be going into the holes labeled WR and the front panel, at the front panel are locking pins going into the holes labeled R. R of course stands for rip. So put them in and a quarter turn to tighten. Remove the two work stops by pushing down low on them. And then have a look at where your saw blade is coming up through the slot. It'll very rarely be dead center. In this case, I'm slightly to the left-hand side of the slot if you're standing at the front panel, in other words, away from the calibrations. If you're not well away from the end which has the calibrations, reach underneath, loosen off the four wing nuts and pull your saw sideways until you're well on this side of center. If you didn't have your slide plate in the correct position, you'll notice that you can't close the table properly. The slide plate must be central, 
and when it's directly between the two reinforcing bars underneath the table, then the table will drop in position and you can lock it in. Assemble the clamping feet and the knobs to the fence, and here's a little hint. Use some spray lubricant inside each of the knobs to make them easier to twirl up. Just fit the clamping foot through the bottom and put the knob on top. And then, very simply, with the knob not fully tightened, leave it four or five turns undone, you place the fence with the high side of the fence closest to the blade, high side closest to the blade, in the two slots like that, reach underneath, give the, the clamping feet a quarter turn to the right or left, and tighten up. Quarter turn and tighten, and then by loosening off slightly, you can adjust the fence at any setting, and then a couple of turns and it's tight. Make sure that the four wing nuts holding your top saw clamps in position are fairly tight and then get an adjustable square or any sort of square, put it on this side of the table, the side that has the calibration scales, and put it up against the disc of the saw. Avoid the teeth, just go between the teeth, and if necessary, adjust the wing nut on the front of the saw, the wing nut which adjusts your blade angle until you're nice and square to this side of the tabletop. The next step is to set your fence in at, at exactly zero. Zero in both windows, sighting through the window and having the line on the fence up against the zero position. And as a hint, use a fine point marker pen or a sharp pencil and just highlight that little mark. It'll make it much easier for you to read later on. Highlight it at both ends and lock the fence off at exactly zero. Having done that, reach underneath the saw, slacken off the four wing nuts which are holding the saw on just loosen them off slightly and then by grabbing hold of the motor and body of the saw you can push the saw so sideways because as you know your saw clamps are only finger tightened push the saw sideways and then until the blade is touching the fence then nip up the four wing nuts and as a final check you should spin the saw blade and just make sure that it's touching the fence at the back of the blade and the front you know that's a little bit close it's slightly scraping, that's okay, it can leave slight scratch marks on the fence. Make sure it's touching at the back and touching at the front of the fence. And then, as a double check, loosen off the two knobs, move the fence, back the fence off slightly, and then approach again and touch the fence with your fingers and thumbs to the blade, just like that and that, and see if you read zero and zero, which you do. If you don't, you may have to reach underneath, loosen the saw off again, wiggle it a little bit and try it again until you've got exactly zero with the fence unclamped. If when you were drilling your holes your drill bit wandered slightly or you may have marked the holes in slightly the wrong position and you can't adjust the back and front of the saw blade so it's touching the fence when it's set exactly at zero, then don't hesitate to use a round file and elongate one or two of your holes a little bit and adjust the clamps. They'll work just as well elongated slightly. Now remove, slacken off the fence and move it aside and unlock the table and remove the table. Before moving the slide plate, take a marker pen and mark on the aluminium channels the position of the slide plate. That'll give you a good reference point for later conversions so you don't have to hunt for the central position. And then very carefully, without bumping the saw, flip it right way up because now you have to finally clamp down your saw and adjust the clamps so that you can remove and refit your saw without having to go through the lining up procedure again. Now fully tighten the back wing nuts, get them nice and tight, and then go around to the front of the saw and remove the two top clamps. Take the top clamps off. And you'll notice that the bottom clamps will probably have a bit of movement in them. Push them so that they're right up, hard up against the edge of the saw because they, they will be your permanent locate, locating points in future. And then you can take a spanner and spanner tighten these. And an, as another hint, don't fully tighten one clamp and then go around the others. Tighten each of them a little bit, tighten that one a bit, then tighten this one a bit. And then back to this one, and then back to this one. So you're tightening them against each other. Try not to bump the saw while you're doing this. And then fully tighten and refit the top clamps with the washers and the coil spring washers. And then having done that on the top, fully tighten the top clamps.
fully tighten the, the two wing nuts at the front and repeat that process on the two back clamps. And then if you ever want to remove and refit your saw for handheld use, which occasionally may come up, then all you have to do is remove the top clamps and the saw will lift straight out and when you put it back in, it'll go back between these snug fitting lower clamps and you won't have to realign in future. If you have one of the smaller saws, say six and a quarter inch or seven and a quarter inch, you may find that when you try to tilt your saw for a 45 degree bevel cut, that the wing nut interferes with the top guard of your saw. In that case, you may want to replace that wing nut with a hexagon nut or dispense with a top clamp altogether, invert the lower clamp and use it as a toe clamp with a shallower bolt and an ordinary hexagon nut to enable you to get to full 45 degrees. It's a very good idea at this point to now flip the saw upside down again, centralize it in the plate, put the table on top, put the rip fence in position and touching the high side of the fence against the blade, make sure you can read zero and zero in both windows. And that ensures that nothing moved while you were spanner tightening. To fit the guard spring, take a small screwdriver, hook it through the eye of the spring and then lift it up, rest the point of the screwdriver on the nib and let the spring slide forward and then you can just push the nib closed and that guard is ready. Take the trigger strap and see how it works. You feed that through there and that becomes a one-way zip. To loosen it, you just press that nib there. You can open and close, otherwise it'll just zip up one way. Many of the smaller saws and the newer saws on the market now have a safety lockout button, either a button there or a button on top. You have to press that first. Sorry, first you feed the trigger strap in and just loosely adjust it. Press the button, pull the trigger, and while holding the trigger, zip up the trigger strap and hold it firmly. There are some saws where it is difficult to fit the trigger strap, particularly the Makita 9 and a quarter inch saw, because the hand grip is very slippery and shiny. To overcome that, put a bit of cloth tape, such as a bit of elastoplast, on the back of the hand grip of the saw, and then you can adjust the trigger strap so it will just sit on the point of the trigger and you just wedge it in position like so and that'll hold and you don't even have to undo the trigger strap for future use you just slide it off the point of the trigger most saws can in fact be strapped up this way if your saw is still giving problems and you can't get it right you may want to cut yourself a little piece out of five ply or something to sit in there and hold the trigger permanently on you should not leave the trigger strapped on indefinitely because the spring in the trigger will fatigue so just as the safety guard is tied back but released when you finish using the machine, when you finish sawing, release the strap and let the spring relax. Fit the safety guard to its rod and you may find you'll have to deburr the ends of the rod slightly if they're burred. When clamping up this thumb screw on top here, don't over tighten it, you may pop the spot welds here. And then you can fit the safety guard into the hole in the table and lower it and use the other thumb screw from the fasteners pack to tighten in position. Now, have a look at the switch and see how it works. There's no power switched on yet, so reach down, switch on, and you can switch off by just hitting that plate. Switch on, and you can either bump it off with your knee or bump it off with the hand, and try that a few times and get the feel of the action. Now, the trigger of the saw is already locked on, so what you can do now is plug the saw in and plug an extension cord in before plugging the extension cord in, make sure you hit that plate first, make sure the power is off. Before doing your very first rip cut, there's a few things you should understand about ripping. Firstly, always use a safety guard. Wherever possible, fit the safety guard and have it adjusted so that the timber can just slide comfortably underneath it. Now, having said that, in this video, you'll see me occasionally not using the safety guard. That's done for visibility purposes, so you can see what's happening. But when you're out working in your shed, use a safety guard. Another thing about ripping, never attempt to do a freehand rip. You'll see some people trying to rip a board following a pencil line, never do that. All that has to happen is your timber has to skew slightly during the cut and the saw blade will grab the timber out of your hands and fling it towards you at a horrifying rate. So always guide the timber against the fence, never cut freehand in the rip saw mode and the fence must always be absolutely parallel to the blade. Now, at the moment I've got the set, fence set at 110 mil and 110 mil. The reading in this window and the reading in that window should always be the same. What you can do later on is experiment by giving yourself an extra half a millimeter in setting, half a millimeter wider at the back than at the front, but that's a fine point 
for, for trial and error. Otherwise, always have exactly the same reading. Never angle the blade, the fence. You'll cause a nasty jam up and ruin your work. Thirdly, never feed from the back of the blade because quite obviously if you fed the timber from the back, the saw blade teeth will dig into the timber and will rip it out of your hands. You feed into the blade so the blade's cutting down onto timber and therefore you have your good face upwards. Let's say you're cutting some veneered board, the good veneered side upwards, that'll be the smoothest cut. Another important point, the edge of the timber which runs against the fence must be straight. If you've got a curved edge or if you've got an edge with some bumps along it, then you won't get a straight cut, you'll duplicate that edge. If you've got a board that's say 140 mil wide and you want to rip it down to 110 mil, then set your fence at 110 mil. Don't set your fence at 30 mil minus the blade width 28 or 27 mil. Set it for the wider dimension so you can pass your fingers safely between the blade and the fence and keep control of the piece that you want, the piece that you want to cut to 110 millimeters. Don't worry so much about this offcut. It's not going to be trapped. When you finish the cut, that will just fall harmlessly aside. Another very important point about ripping, always work with a lowered saw blade. Now, have the blade down as low as you can so that the tips of the teeth just break through the timber. That's not only done for safety reasons. The lower the blade is, the less danger there is of an accident. It's also done because a lowered blade will give you a cleaner, smoother cut. So always set your saw blade so that the teeth are just protruding above the timber. Now, with the board hard against the fence, the straight edge of the board against the fence, you can apply pressure here at this point in front of the saw blade, never beside the blade, always in front, and propel the piece with your other hand, keeping your thumb well tucked in and your fingers bunched together like this. And then what I'll do, I'll just rip a little way into this board and show you how, how you can make sure that your saw is on absolutely straight. I'll leave the guard off for visibility purposes. You just rip a small amount into the board and then flip the board over, put it back against the fence and see if you can spin the saw blade in the cut which you've just made. You should be able to do that. If you can, then your saw is on straight. If you can't, Double check the setting in the windows, make sure you're right. And if you still can't spin the blade in the cut you've just made, then readjust your saw very slightly by loosening the saw clamps. But if you're happy with that, then you can fit the safety guard, fit it and adjust it, and make the cut. Now you'll notice that once the saw blade has finished cutting, once I'm at this point with the blade, I will keep pushing this piece right through behind the back of the blade of the machine. Pushing that through, the back of the blade should not have been recutting this face. You might in fact want to do a cut without the garden position and just see if it does recut. It shouldn't do. If it does, then again your blade and your fence are slightly out of alignment. Now inspect the piece of timber. First check the cut for straightness and hold a straight edge along it and make sure it's fairly straight. There's a little bit of light showing at this point because of my saw blade. I'll speak about that later. Then. If this was a face which was upwards, marked by the X, measure from the opposite face, the, the face that was lying on the Triton table, and check it with a square at several points and see how square it is. Now it may v vary very slightly during the cut, some more about that later. Rip cuts generally are, it's very hard to, to maintain perfect accuracy all the way along, but you'll see in the ripping section how to cope with that. And if you're happy with that position, fine. If not, you may have to readjust the wing nut at the front of your saw that, to adjust the blade angle tilt. Otherwise, that should be okay. And now you're ready to check the saw in the cross-cut mode when set up as a rip saw. Now take the mitre gauge and with the strip facing you, facing towards you, make sure it's a nice easy slide all the way along. Okay, now get a straight piece of timber, make sure it's got a nice and straight face and have that face arrowed and have it against the upstand of the mitre gauge. 
what you'll be, how you'll be holding it is wrapping your fingers around the timber and your thumb around the back of the mitre gauge and gripping it quite firmly. Now you also have to apply some pressure downwards so you can press down on this knob here and feed gently and smoothly all the way through. Don't jerk the timber into the cut. Notice now the off-cut problem. If you just have the timber slightly over the uh, cutting path of the blade, then you may have a three or four millimeter off-cut which could fall down between the blade and the slot in the table. Try and avoid that. Either just take off a load of sawdust or a paper-thin off-cut if necessary, or make sure you've got a decent sort of off-cut which has table support and can't fall down there and jam. Also notice, as I finish the cut, even though the saw blade has cut through this point here, I'll keep going right through to the back of the blade and just make sure that the teeth aren't recutting the timber as I go through. You should fit the safety guard, but again I won't, just so that you can see what's happening. Switch on the power, grip it fairly firmly, and slide through. You could just hear the teeth dancing against the side of there, but they weren't cutting it. That's the back teeth. You could hear it, but they weren't really damaging it in any way. Now, always clean the fibres off your cut. Make sure those fibres, any uncut fibres, are removed because they will affect your reading. And then taking your square, working from the face which you've ar arrowed, because this is a face that was against the mitre gauge, check it for square that way, and have a look at that and see if that's good enough. Uh, there's a little bit of ridging there, but again, that's in the saw blade. More on that later. And then, if you're happy with that, if you, rather, if you're not happy with that, you may want to readjust your setting slightly one way or the other to get it right. But get that right first, and then take a reading from the face opposite the arrowed face. In other words, the face which was sitting on the triton table. Take a reading from there and check that at several points. Again, that should be pretty good. If it's not, the problem may be in your blade angle adjuster. Once you're happy with those two cuts, your Triton is virtually ready to go in the ripsaw mode. Now you've got to fine-tune the Triton for docking saw cuts. And to do that, you have to convert, of course, so remove all the accessories from your table, remove the fence, unlock the table. Now, you can leave this thumb screw in position but when you're taking the table off, try not to bang the table down on the thumb screw. You could damage the thread. Take the table off like that. Flip the saw right way up, but don't drop those bearings in because you don't want the blade fully, fully down yet. Turn the table around so the T-shaped holes are near the end panel, the rear panel, and you can slide the table in underneath until the locking keys can go into the holes labeled D for docking. And now, of course, you can drop that in and check the slide action, make sure it's all okay. Now you'll notice that my power cord is now between the channel and the table. That's okay, you can operate it like this, although the, the safest method is to have the power cord out over the, back of, over the front of the machine, but you can have it in there. Just make sure when you're doing docking saw cuts that the cable doesn't catch in this, cor this back corner here. Otherwise, this way you won't have to unplug and replug your saw when you're converting. Fit the work stops. Again, the notched work stop, the one with the notch in it, goes on the left-hand side, virtually underneath the, the motor of the saw, and the plain work stop on the right-hand side. Fit them, clear the table off, and then have a look down from the bottom, and just make doubly sure that at full travel, your saw blade isn't running out of slot in the table, and that the tips of your teeth are just entering the slot in the table, just about a millimetre or so below the top surface. Now take a piece of timber with a straight face, and arrow that face, Always have your straight face against the work stops. It's no good if the timber can rock or, or move on the, against the work stops. Also clear any sawdust that might have accumulated there. Put that in there and have the end of the timber just over the halfway point in the slot in the table. Just over halfway. Now, bunch your fingertips together and push against this back edge of the timber here. So you're pushing down. You're virtually pushing the timber into that corner there, holding it down and pushing it away from you. Now, the trigger of the saw is still locked on. Leave it locked on. I know you can reach the trigger and use it this way, and you may prefer to use it uh, this way in operation, but you'll find it's generally better to actually leave the trigger locked on, switch on the power of the switch, and simply slide the Triton slide plate by its back edge like that. 
you'll find it's better that way you'll get a more accurate cut hold the timber down firmly push the timber push the saw feeding it smoothly and gently don't jerk it into the timber again and also when you've finished your cut do not pull the saw back you'll see during the operational section on docking saw cross cutting why you don't pull the saw back after you've finished the cut make it a rule get into the habit now finish your cut and let the saw stop at the full full travel at the rear frame end Again, clean off these fibres, this beard, the uncut fibres, they will affect your reading. And taking a reading from the arrowed face, the face which was against the work stops, take a reading along the cut. That's called along the cut. Check that for square. That looks pretty good, apart from the ridging. Now, take a reading from the face which was lying on the triton table. In other words, the face opposite this one. And see if it's square across the cut. Now, I've got a very slight error there. Most saws will have a bit of an error there. That's caused by the slump in the saw itself. Any flexibility in the portable saw, or if you can put your fingers on the motor and rock up and down, any flexibility there will affect your reading across the cut. Now, of course, you can compensate for that by adjusting the wing nut on the front of your saw, the wing nut that adjusts the blade angle, but you don't have to. Leave that locked. That's the position you are happy in, in the rip saw position. To get this then accurate, adjust the triton table instead. You will generally find that the left-hand side of the triton table has to be adjusted downward slightly. Loosen off the knobs and just set it down experimentally by, say, two millimetres at the front panel and two millimetres on this side of the back panel. Drop the table down slightly on this side, do another test cut and check it for square across the cut. And once you've got your right position, you might have to go down anything as much as four or five millimetres on the left-hand side. Once you've got your true position, then you can lock that off fairly tightly, lock off this other side as well, lock off all four of these knobs, and then store this spanner on the back panel. Don't store it on, on the front because you won't get access to locking pins, but store it on the knob of the back panel. When you've got your correct position and you're cutting square in the docking saw position, get a fine point marker pen and just make a little mark on your end panels at each of the four corners to show you where the table is set for a correct docking saw cut. If you're looking at this section, it's probably because you've experienced some cutting inaccuracies during your test cuts. Before jumping to any conclusions about your saw or your blade or the way you've set up your triton, first check your square. Very many of them are inaccurate from brand new, and especially if you've dropped them a few times, they might go out of square. This is how you check a square. Get a board which has an absolutely straight edge. That edge must be dead flat, and check it by holding the square against it and seeing if any light shows through it. Once you're happy that that's a nice straight edge, get a sharp pencil, hold your square firmly against the sharp edge, and keeping the pencil angle constant, mark a line. Then flip the square over on the other side and compare your square to the line and see if there's any inaccuracy. Now, bear in mind that any error shown between the square blade and the pe pencil line is double the error in your square. It magnifies it by two, so don't be too critical on your square. But if there's any significant error, then take the square back if it's brand new to the hardware store and take a board with you and check through all the squares they've got in stock until you've got one that's spot on. A quick word on reading your square. If you hold your piece of timber and the square up against a strong light, you can see a gap of half a thou, half of a thousandth of an inch. So don't be too critical. In fact, the correct way to read a square is against a normal light in front of you like that. And uh, if you basically can't see any light or only a tiny crack of light between the ridge marks of the cut, then that's a square cut. If your square is accurate and you're not getting perfect cuts, then have a close look at your power saw. And most power saws, especially the less expensive type, the handyman quality saws such as this one, have what's called as arbor float. Now that's the ability of the saw blade to move sideways, very slightly. Grab the nut which holds the blade on and see if you can move it in and out. Don't worry about rotational slack. Don't worry about the blade turning slightly that way. That's, not, that's no problem. In and out is what you're worried about. That's called arbor float. If you have a less expensive saw, one of these type, they have bushes in the arbor and that arbor float is generally not repairable. If you have a higher quality saw with ball bearings in the arbor, 
take it to a qualified power tool technician and they can remove your arbor float at a very low price. Remember, if you want absolutely accurate cuts, you must have a saw which has a tight arbor, so get it fixed or upgrade your saw. Another troublesome area with many portable saws is a bit of sloppiness in the motor and, uh, and body housing. Uh, you'll probably find that that's due to a bit of slack in this front bracket here behind the wing nut that adjusts the saw. And uh, if you've got a saw which has a bolt through that bracket, then perhaps tighten the nut first and see if that eliminates the problem or partially eliminates the problem. If you've got a rivet or a rolled pin through there, you may in fact have to even drift that out uh, and replace it with a bolt and a lock nut. If you've got a bolt and a nut already in there, you may find that by undoing the nut, and you'll get better access to it by tipping the whole thing to 45 degrees, undo that nut, remove the bolt, and you may have to make up a little shim washer out of some very thin sheet metal to poke in between that bracket and the body of the saw. If you haven't got any shim material, you could try cutting up an old soft drink can, which is very thin sheet metal, and wiggling a shim into position to just take up any slack there. This rivet at the back of the saw is also often a cause of problem by being too sloppy. Uh, you'll get better access to it if you raise the saw blade and uh, raise the saw blade and remove the blade itself. And if that rivet is sloppy, you can generally rig up something by clamping a block of steel in your vise, resting the block of steel against the back of the rivet and hammering it to pin it a little tighter. Alternatively, you can try and drill that rivet out and replace it with a bolt and a lock nut. There is another way of coping with some mechanical sloppiness in your saw, not with the arbor, but with the saw mounting to its base. And that is to insert a piece of packing underneath the motor of the saw, a bit of packing which you can wedge under there. You would generally probably need a strap across the top of the motor to hold that firmly down to the slide plate. However, there is a problem. If you do lash your saw motor down like this, of course you can't raise and lower the blade. There are two solutions. Firstly, you can make up two wedges which wedge in on, on slots with wing nuts perhaps, two wedges that fit underneath the motor and will steady it at any point, whether it's fully down or raised for a rebate cut. Or you could even make up a fairly elaborate slotted metal bracket which may pick up one or the two of the screws on the end of the motor and allow the motor to rise and fall as you adjust the blade height. If you're going to those sort of elaborate lengths to get accuracy out of your saw, then obviously you're looking for perfection and we would suggest that you may want to consider buying a better saw, upgrading. If you're in doubt as to what brand of saw to buy, why don't you contact us? We'll give you our recommendations depending on what sort of work you'll be doing. You may have found when you had the saw upside down in the rip saw mode that you couldn't quite get the blade dead square to the rip fence or to the side of the table. Now, it could be for one of two reasons. Firstly, if you've got a little foot on the saw like this one, that may be stopping you and you may have to get some pliers or a spanner and just bend that foot very slightly. If, however, you've just run out of adjustment slot on that curved slot and you're fully home and you still can't get dead square to the table or you get it dead square but then the saw blade slumps back very slightly, then get a thin piece of packing, a bit of aluminium or steel, and insert it under this side of the saw shoe, underneath the clamps preferably, or just clamp down by the top clamps. If you have accidentally knocked your Triton chassis out of alignment, and you can sometimes do this if you awkwardly unplug it from the stand, and you'll notice this because one of the locking pins will be an easy fit and the other one will be a very tight fit. Well, here's what you do. Unplug your Triton chassis from the stand, put it on the floor resting on its back panel, have the table in position, and looking down through the front panel, through these two slots, make sure that the holes in the rails here line up exactly with the holes in the table, and in fact, you can parallelogram the table to one side or the other until the locking pins go neatly into their holes. And then your Triton chassis is trued up again. Now let's have a closer look at some of the inaccuracies that you may have experienced in the docking saw mode. This problem here, this high spot, which is normally burnt by the saw blade, is caused by arbor float. And as mentioned earlier, you have to get that eliminated if you want to cut perfectly. I'll show you in a moment how you can minimize that problem. But a high spot there will throw you out in your accuracy reading along the cut and across the cut at that point. It'll be quite square everywhere else. But right there, for that reading and that reading, it'll be out. Also, that slight ridge there is a telltale giveaway sign. On this piece, you've not only got arbor float, there's a ridge, but also widespread burning. Now, this suggests that the saw is on crookedly. Turn the Triton saw into a rip saw bench and just make sure that the blade and the fence when they're touching each other, 
read dead zero through the windows in the fence. And this cut here is generally burnt all the way along and is very badly ridged. Now this is due exclusively to the saw blade. I've been using a pressed metal blade and they're really not much good anymore. Use tungsten tip blades and have a look at the section coming up shortly. If you have got a burnt or polished high spot on your cut due to arbor float, you can generally remove it by putting the timber back in the triton, pushing the saw into position, push the timber lightly against the saw blade, just touch it against the blade, pull the saw back, and then switch on the power and make a couple of finishing cuts, just planing that arbor float off. When selecting a saw blade, the first decision you should make is, should you get a tungsten tip blade? And the answer definitely is yes. Tungsten tip blades last much, much longer than pressed metal blades. They stay sharper. They can be resharpened very cheaply, about 28 cents a tooth. And they can even be re-tipped if you happen to break a tooth. It costs about $3 a tooth. Now, the number of teeth is of prime importance. For cross-cutting, you should have the maximum number of teeth you can afford and because the more teeth you have, the more you'll pay for the blade, you have to make a decision there. As a general rule of thumb, if you've got a seven and a quarter inch saw, at least 24 teeth, an eight and a quarter inch saw, at least 30, a nine and a quarter inch saw, at least 40 teeth. The more teeth you have, the smoother, more accurate your cuts will be. The next thing you have to decide is how thick the blade should be. Now, you can have thin blades and you can have thick blades. If you've got a saw that has arbor float, or if the saw's got a lot of sloppiness in its base mounting, then you should really go for a thinner blade. The cut it gives you isn't quite as smooth and as clean as a thick blade, but the saw blade's working much less hard. If this blade, for example, this one cuts two millimeters wide and this one cuts three millimeters wide, then this one is cutting 50% harder than this one, obviously. So a thinner blade if you've got a sloppy saw. If you've got a good saw, go for a thicker blade. You should also check your blade for flatness, get a straight edge and put it across the diameter. Don't get hung up on a tooth and check to see how flat it is. Check it from one side, check it from the other and check it at various points. Also, try to avoid buying a saw blade where you have to use a little spacer bush because those spacer bushes can sometimes de deform the blade. Sometimes they get out of position and can cause, can cause blade vibration. Another thing to look for is surface grinding, edge grinding of the teeth after they've been brazed on. And have a close look in a strong light and you should see very faint scratch marks, grinding marks on the sides of the teeth and on a very good blade on the fronts of the teeth as well. The fronts and sides and even the tops are ground, surface ground to give you a perfectly flush finish. Otherwise, of course, one tooth could be doing all the cutting, the tooth which is sticking out the furthest. If you've been looking at blades, and in case you're wondering what these little slots are for, they're called expansion slots, and as the blade heats, heats up, they'll prevent any tendency for the blade to buckle. So they're a good idea, but not necessary. If the blade's a good one, it shouldn't heat up excessively. One final point about blades, when you're selecting a blade, don't skimp as far as price goes, because after all, the blade does all the work. And if you pay an extra $20 now for a saw blade, over the next five years that you use that blade, that $20 will be well worth spending. When selecting router bits, there's really only one sort you should get, and that's tungsten carbide tipped, because high-speed steel bits just don't last very long. They wear out and have to be resharpened interminably. Tungsten carbide will go the distance. As far as shank length goes, look at this. A half-inch capacity bit can have a very long shank. A quarter-inch capacity bit for a small router is limited to a very short shank and you'll find when studying the router section of this video that short shank bits can have their limitations. If you haven't already got a router, get one that'll take a half inch shank and then you can get the long shank extended bits. If you've checked your local hardware store or stores and are not satisfied with the selection available, feel free to order saw blades and router bits from us. The quality is exceptionally high and the prices are very competitive. Before making a docking saw cut, there's a couple of things you ought to check. Firstly, check that the slide action is very smooth from end to end. There mustn't be any, any constriction at any point. Uh, if it's a little bit tight, get some spray lubricant as shown earlier and spray the open faces of the channels on both sides until you've got a nice, easy slide. Secondly, 
check that the saw blade is fully down, lowered fully down, and check that at that point, the tips of the teeth are just entering the slot in the table. Now, in docking, you can either use the trigger of the saw and just switch on and give it a burst of power for cutting, or if your saw's got a little bit of sloppiness in it, up and down movement there, you can lock the trigger on, switch on the power at the switch of the machine, and slide the saw by means of the back of the tray. Now, talking about the switch, the operator always, of course, stands at the switch end. You never work from the other end of the machine. And the recommended operating position is to stand on the right-hand side uh, so that you're holding the timber with your right hand and pushing the saw with your left. The way to hold the timber is to bunch your fingertips together and holding on this leading back edge here, you push the timber down and forward so you're actually pushing it into the corner of that work stop. Push it down like that. Uh, your fingers should rarely go inside the channels, if ever. Make it a rule to keep them outside of the channels. You would find, if working from this side of the machine, that you've got a bit of difficulty in holding a shorter piece because you're further away from the central cutting slot. And also, in the case of smaller saws, you've got an access problem, a clearance problem. You won't have room to put your hand in. Before making the cut, always have the, a straight face of the timber arrowed against the work stops. It's no good putting a rocky face or a bumpy face against the work stops. That must be straight. Your desired cutting position, have that roughly halfway across the slot in the table. And this is how you'll sight up cuts. You open this flap, push the saw into position, and look down through the gap between, beside the saw blade. You can turn the saw blade around by, by hand until a tooth is touching the pencil line. Line the timber up there. And now you can make a little test nick just to see if you're in the right spot, just like this. If you're happy with that position, you can go ahead and make your cut. If you're not happy, you can readjust your timber slightly one way or the other and then make your cut. <clears throat> one very important thing. A small off cut will be created here, something about half an inch wide. When you've made the cut, don't pull the saw back with the blade still spinning. Make the cut and let the saw stop. You can remove the piece of timber you want, but let the saw come to a halt before pulling it back in case you hit that off cut. If you do recut that off cut, you could damage your blade, you could damage your triton table, and you could also cause a serious accident. So this is how you cut. Notice also the rate of feed. You never jerk the saw into the timber. You feed it creamily and smoothly all the way through, just like this. When, when checking the cut, you always work from the arrowed face, the face which was against the work stops. Remove any fibres and check it with a square that way and with a square that way. If it's out this way, then probably you've got a little bit of misadjustment in your saw, maladjustment in your saw or your table, or you've got a bit of sloppiness in the saw, in which case use a locked-on trigger technique. This is the off-cut that you have to be careful of. Never pull your saw back on it, even though you may see me occasionally doing it in this video for, for time-saving purposes. Don't. It's a risk you shouldn't take. One of the most useful features of a docking saw is the fact that you can repetition cut. What this means is that you can rough cut your pieces to size, a little bit longer than you need, and measure and mark one piece only. Let's say you're making four table legs, for example. Measure and mark one only, the one closest to your blade. Lay the four pieces into the machine like so. And you can line up the dressed ends with uh, either the back of your square or just by eye. Line them up perfectly like that. And then slide all four of them into position, sighting up your saw blade to the first one, the one you've marked. Like so. And make the cut. That way, all four table legs will be identical for size. Let's say you need to cut eight pieces. Well, 
Take those four out. Use one of them as a master. Remove any offcuts. Put your other four pieces in. Always make sure there's no sawdust against the work stops. That'll give you an, an error. Put your other four pieces in. Again, line up the dressed ends, the ends facing away from the blade. Line them up. Get your master, put that in, line it up as well, and then touch the master to the side of the saw blade. Just like that. Then you can remove the master and make the cut. If you're doing a lot of repetition cutting, there's a very useful gauge you can make yourself. Get a long straight piece of timber, preferably hardwood, uh, from say one and a half meters long or thereabouts. Screw it to both of your work stops through the holes provided. Now the very first cut you make will give you a permanent sighting point, right there, a permanent sighting mark for future cuts. Glue a tailor's measure um, down to the top of the right hand side of the stop and you can make up a very handy little rider like this, just two bits of two by one. Make sure the end grain of this piece is flush with the vertical face of that. And you can sit this on top of the fence, G-clamp it in position, and you'll have a perfect length gauge. Now, you may find when removing and refitting the length gauge, it may not want to go back in exactly the same spot. And of course, to keep the accuracy of your scale, it has to go back in the same spot. What do you do there? Drill two very small holes in the back of the work stop. Put a couple of nails in, just hammer them half into the timber, and then nip off the heads or hacksaw them off, and it'll be doweled so you can remove and refit a dozen times, and it'll always go back in exactly the same spot. One of the most useful ways of joining two pieces of timber at right angles is to do a rebate like this, and it's very, very simple on the Triton. And you don't just do one rebate, you do several of them, uh, taped together as shown here. More, more on that in a moment. The way you raise your saw blade is by simply using the adjuster on the back of your saw to raise or lower it, the wing nut or the lever. And if you've got a lever type and it's a little bit stiff, spray it with some spray lubricant in there, make it slide easier. To set the required depth of rebate, simply mark how deep you want to go on one piece of timber, on the end grain. Place that in position in the Triton table move your saw into position and looking down from the side lower your saw blade until the lowest tooth is just level with the line happy with that position remove your mark your sample piece now in terms of marking out the width of the rebate you only need to mark one piece don't mark all four you'll just compound your error if you're having an error so just mark one of them put it in the triton table and uh sighting up through the flap working between the cuts we suggest you start close to the right hand line say but well in the waist area and then creep up on the right hand line get that right and then move over to left hand line very simply like this Did you notice during those cuts that there's no problem in pulling the saw back while the blade was still spinning? Obviously because the offcut is still connected, it hasn't been turned into an offcut yet. Now let's say you've made your rebates and they're a fraction on the tight side. Well it's better to be tight than loose of course, but if they are a little bit too tight to fit your timber in, here's what you do. Put your rebate back in position, walk your saw in until the blade is back in the slot and then move the timber sideways until you're very slightly deflecting the saw blade. Just a whisker, then pull back, and when you come through under power, you'll be skimming a very small amount off the right hand or left hand side of the rebate. Let's say you want to rebate some tall pieces of timber like this, and you want to rebate them in from the top so that you can check in a piece like that. Well, obviously it wouldn't fit under your normal triton table height. So you simply lower the Triton table at the front and back and lower it an equal amount. Before dropping it, make a mark as to where you were set before in your normal docking saw position and then drop it an equal amount. In other words, 
If you were set on 80 here and 84 there, you might go to 150 and 154. So equally both sides. Notice one other thing too. The uh, work stops aren't really tall enough to support a piece of timber like this without rocking. So I've screwed two pieces of similar timber to the work stops as supports. Again, this job is best done if you repetition, if you work in, on a repetition basis, two, three or four pieces clamped together or you can nail a brace onto the end grain to hold them in line, put them in like that and do a series of cuts to make your rebate. When dropping the table, don't be too finicky about the exact table height setting. Get it even, make sure you've dropped by the same amount both sides, front and back, but your fine tuning adjustment for the height is in your saw blade itself. You can virtually double the depth of cut of your saw. Let's say uh, you've got a piece of timber which you can't normally cut in one, one part of the saw, but you could do it in two. Well, simply drop your table down the required amount so that your timber fits comfortably underneath the channel. You need about six or eight millimetres of gap there. Now, you'll, and you'll be doing this in two cuts. Now, you obviously have to line up your two cuts so that they meet perfectly. There are two ways of doing it. If you're working on short pieces, you can set the rip fence of the triton in this slot. You reverse the rip fence, set it in this slot and use it as a stop, butt the timber up against it, do one cut, turn the timber over, butt it up again and do a second cut. If you're working on longer pieces, this is how you do it. Let's say this is a point that you want to cut. Well, a couple of inches back from that, say 50 millimetres, square a line all the way around the piece of timber. If it's a long length, of course, you'll have to support the end hanging out of the machine. But put the timber into the triton, line your saw up with the desired cut mark, looking down through the flap, like so, and then wherever this squared around line reaches a tabletop, make a little pencil mark or just a dot or a mark like that. And that'll be your sighting point. Now make one cut. Turn the timber over, line up the squared around line with your pencil mark. You can even do a little test here again. Looks good. And that's how you get a double cut. If you've got a slight step left, then you can just put the timber back in again with the step facing uppermost. Just touch it lightly against the saw blade and just do a finishing cut just to take that whisker of a ridge off if there is one. A lot of projects you might be building involve wider cross cutting, cutting up to 600 mil wide, for example, for bench tops, shelving, wall units and things like that. Now the Triton normally can only cut about 18 inches or 450 mil. There is a way, a very good way of cutting wider and this is it. One important thing. Your board has to be absolutely parallel. These two faces must be parallel for this to work properly. And what you do is you simply loosen the adjuster on your saw, raise the saw blade so that you can admit your piece of timber. Slide the timber into position. You can sight down from here and lower your saw blade stationary against the pencil line. When you're happy with the position, hold the timber, switch on and plunge down like this. Take the timber over, out, flip it over, put it back into position, drop the saw blade back into the slot you've just made, just like that, and lock it off. Now you may have to move the timber slightly sideways one way or the other, make sure it's a nice easy slide and then do the cut. And that's how you can cut up to 24 inches or 600 millimetres wide. All the cuts you've seen so far have been, the cut has been started by the front of the blade. You can also cut to the back of the blade in much the same way as a radial arm saw cuts by attaching two packers to your work stops, two identical packers. So you can start off with your saw behind the work, put your piece of timber in and make the cut. Before you do this, 
a couple of very important things. Make sure the lever or the wing nut for raising and lowering your blade is locked off firmly. Make sure also your wrist and your elbow are rigid because if you let the saw feed at its own rate, it'll tend to climb up on the work too fast. This is all you do. You'll notice that the top face, the face which was pointing upwards, is the cleanest, sharpest face. So this is very good for cutting picture framing or moulding because you won't splinter or damage the top face the saw's cutting down onto it. Also, the saw tends to hold the timber down on the table rather than lifting it, so it's much easier for small fiddly pieces to cut it this way. It doesn't matter whether you are climb cutting or feed cutting, which is a normal way, these two packers are a very good idea to, to make up because it brings the work closer to you. And on small pieces, there's less back strain. You don't have to bend over the timber as much when you're cutting. You can get excellent mitres on your triton if you follow a few very simple rules. Firstly, when you're mitre cutting, the timber will want to creep along the gauge uh, and that'll give you a slight curve in your cut. So if you haven't already got sandpaper on the front of your gauge, glue some sandpaper down. Now, put the gauge in the slot about halfway along, loosen this knob a few turns, turn the locking head underneath through 90 degrees and then lock it off and set it at 45 degrees, lock both wing nuts. Get a scrap piece of timber, something fairly easy to cut, like some particle board, for example. Hold it against the gauge with the end about two inches or so hanging over the, the slot in the table and grip it like this. You're holding the timber down with one finger, other fingers wrapped over the edge of the mitre gauge and your thumb holding the timber firmly. You may have to clamp your timber, but you shouldn't have to if you've got sandpaper on the front of your gauge. Again, you sight up through here and make a cut. Put the two pieces together on a flat surface and check firstly that edge there. If there's any gaping there, then your saw blade adjuster is wrongly set or the angle of your triton table is not quite right. Uh, and that'll eliminate any gap which you might have in this face. Now check it to see if those two 45 degree cuts add up to 90 degrees. That is actually perfect as it is. If it's not, you may have to adjust your gauge very slightly one way or the other. And I say very slightly because what you're doing when you reverse your off cut against your main cut, you're doubling your error. So if you've got, it might look like a significant error in there, but you may only have to adjust the mitre gauge very, very slightly. So do a couple of test cuts on a piece of scrap until you're happy with your true 45 position. Then get a scriber and make a scratch mark on the paintwork, just there, in line with the line on the aluminium strip and that'll give you your true 45 position. Then, reverse the mitre gauge to find 45 in the opposite direction, like so, and you may have to, in fact, remove this work stop and relocate the gauge at this end of the table, but wherever you decide to do it, let's say you do it there. Set it on 45. Now notice something. There's quite a big gap from there to there unsupported and uh, that'll be difficult when cutting because uh, your all the pressure is being applied here and the fulcrum point will be there and the timber will want a rock and especially if you're cutting flimsy picture framing material or beading you must have backup support in this area here there's an easy way of doing that just get a solid lump of parallel sided framing timber put it in like so you can actually touch this corner of the timber to the blade. You might even want to mitre cut this first to give you perfect support, but then rest your piece of timber against it, slide it in and do a cut. Then again, check it with your square, make sure it adds up to exactly, exactly 90 degrees. And again, with your scriber, make a pencil, pencil notch. If you're mitre cutting things like picture framing and thin molding, then you'll find that probably the best way to cut it is to carefully do it as a climb cut in other words, cutting with the back of the blade, as you saw a few moments ago, uh, because the climb cut leaves the top face unsplintered. But be careful when climb cutting, wrist and elbow rigid, and 
the lever or the wing nut locked in, in, in position and gently feed the saw backwards. Let's say you want to cut more than 45 degrees, 60 for example, like this. Well, 60 is 45 plus 15, so set your gauge at 15 degrees, get a wide board, do a cut, and the off cut will look like this. It'll have a 15 degree angle at that point. Now, take your board out, relocate your gauge if necessary, lock it in position, and then set your gauge at 45, and lock it. Put the piece in at 15 degrees, and preferably G-clamp that to the tabletop, like so. And then you've got an angle of approach of 60 degrees, and you can make up several boards at 15, 20, 30 degrees, whichever you want. Put your timber in and make two cuts. When you're mitre cutting and you're working with basically flat material, then you cut your first angle like that, and to get your reverse angle, you simply flip the timber over on its back, put it back in, and that automatically gives you the reverse angle. What happens, though, if you're working with some moulding, which obviously can't be flipped on its back? Well, there's a very simple jig which you can make up, which will save you a lot of time and effort and give you perfect mitres. Two pieces of timber, very straight, screwed onto the mitre gauge, uh, screwed and glued at exactly 90 degrees, and a gusset plate in there will ensure that it stays at 90 degrees, and you screw that onto your mitre gauge. You can make yourself a little stop block like that, that's just mitre cut and cross cut, and that will, can be clamped onto here as a stop, you can just clamp it on like so, and that'll make sure you don't have to cut to a pencil line, you make your first cut, butt your timber in against it, and make your second cut. I'll show you how it works. Here's some architrave, for example. The high side should always be against the fence. In this case, being architrave, I'll climb cut it, put the timber in like so. And now to get the reverse angle, I'll simply slide this in, butt it up against the stop, and make the second cut. And every piece that you treat that way by butting it up against the stop there, every piece that you treat that way will be exactly the same length and your mitres will be absolutely perfect. Let's say you've got a wide board up to 18 inches wide and you want to put a 45 degree angle on that. Well, that's called a bevel cut, and the way you do it is like this. Firstly, you raise your saw blade, you raise your saw out of the table, out of the slide, so that the saw blade's up out of the slot. Then you mark with a scriber your position that the saw was set at, that's your true zero position. Loosen the wing nuts, angle the saw blade to 45, and set it for the moment at 45 according to the saw scale. You may have to adjust that. Make sure your blade's fully down, now you can drop it back in the slot. Get two pieces of packing. You'll need anywhere between uh, 15 and 22 millimetre, depending on the size of your saw. And put the packing underneath, on your triton table, underneath your blade. And just run the saw across and make sure that the teeth are just walking across the timber. If necessary, raise and lower very slightly using the adjuster. Now get a couple of pieces of scrap. You'll only be cutting a whisker off the end of each. Put them in. hold them together, and make a cut. Put those two pieces together and check them with your square to see if they add up to exactly 90 degrees. If they do, then make another scratch with your scriber at the true 45 position on the scale of your saw. And you're set for bevel cutting. Now, Get a couple of solid pieces, some, something with a bit of thickness in it, a bit of depth. Put your two pieces in, um, have the ends hanging just over the score line which your saw blade has made. Hold them quite firmly, pressing down from the top. There's a lot of load on the timber during this cut, and you may also want to lock your trigger on and push the saw by the back of the slide to prevent any twist on the hand grip of the saw. But this is how you make the bevel cut. As I mentioned, there's a lot of load on the saw, and you can see there's a slight recut there, a bit of burning because the saw and the blade 
uh, are have, under tremendous pressure making this cut. Ha what you can do to eliminate that problem is to make your cut and then creep your timber over the score line just a fraction, just a whisker over the line and then make a finishing cut, just like this. And that finishing cut has just taken a quarter of a blade width off the cut. The, the saw and blade are working 25% as hard as they were before, and it should give you a perfect result, except, of course, if you've got arbor float in your saw. Then, having done those two pieces, turn them around, make sure these ends are exactly in line, and then make your second cut, and that way you don't have to measure and mark, you don't have to cut to a line, because when bevel cutting, it is quite difficult to sight down through the flap. So this is the way you do it, get those two ends in line and then trim off the excess with one cut. A very important point about bevel cutting, you'll notice that the saw blade set at 45 degrees will pass through this notch in the work stop. If you're doing less than 45 degrees, always do a dummy run first and make sure your saw blade is not in danger of hitting that work stop. If it is, remove it. There's an excellent platform you can make yourself which will be useful for bevel cutting and for routing. Use some particle board and uh, on this subject I'm using custom wood here. Custom wood, also known as craft wood. It's a uh, high density particle board. It's, uh, as you can see compared to normal particle board, much finer grain. It's very flat and uniform and stays pretty straight. So use this. It machines and saws and routes beautifully and is a very good surface for painting. This platform, I've got some masonite packing underneath it to get up the right height and two shallow pieces glued and screwed on the ends and this enables me to slide it in position and the two bearers drop on the on either side of the table so it doesn't have any sidewards movement then the very first cut you make will give you a score line there and a 45 degree cut through there like this Now, if you want to cut a piece of timber exactly to a line, mark it out either on the edge, like that at 45, or just across the top, because you can now use either of those two marks, your score line or your first cut, to give you a permanent sighting position for lining up a cut. A bevel joint like this is very attractive, but it's not terribly strong unless you dowel it. There's a much easier way than doweling. Simply get the pieces together, mark the midpoint of your bevel on one of them only, and put them in the machine from the left-hand side to give you the reverse angle. And mark, put up, line your pencil mark up with the center of your cut in there, raise your saw blade or whisker, hold the timber firmly, and do a cut. Now, it doesn't even matter if the cuts weren't dead centre, as long as they're done two at a time, they must line up perfectly and you glue a keyway in there. Turn your triton into a rip saw and rip yourself a narrow piece exactly the width of your saw blade, and that will key that joint together beautifully and strongly. Now, if that's to be your most, your paramount face, the visible face, and you don't want to mark it with a keyway join, in the rip saw mode you can do a groove that way, and then cut a piece in like so, and again, it gives you great strength without destroying your beauty of your mitre because you're keyed from the back. Let's say you want to do a bevel mitre or compound cut that is angled this way and angled that way as well. Well, very simply, you set your saw blade at the required angle, set your mitre gauge at the required angle, and put some packing under your work, and then it's as easy, easy as this to cut a bevel mitre. You can get some spectacular results by bending a solid piece of timber by doing what's known as kerfing. Now, kerfing is a series of cuts almost all the way through the timber, parallel cuts evenly spaced, and that enables you to get a bend. Now, the, the radius that you get depends on how close or far apart the cuts are. As you can see, the closer they are together, the tighter your radius will be.
what you'll find is that for a given thickness of timber, let's say a bit of four by one and a half, one and a half inches thick, that might take 14 cuts to give you a right angle. You may find on trial and error that uh, it might, 14 might be slightly less than a right angle, 15 might be slightly too many. In that case, make your first cut and your last cut slightly wider by doing a cut and then a shaving cut. Uh, the, you have to select your timber very carefully for this. It must be long grained and straight grained. You can use a lot of different timbers. Pine is quite satisfactory as long as it's long and straight grained, uh, not knotty or streaky. Uh, consult your timber yard perhaps and get their advice on what's the best long straight grained timber for this, to use for this. You also should use water or steam or hot water preferably and wet the back of it only. Rub it with a rag and wet that and all the time keep flexing it and bending it closer and closer. Be patient, it takes there's a lot of trial and error in getting curfing right, but it can give you some magnificent results. If you want to get the, uh, a bit of strength back into it, because this is really just glued at those points there, and it holds fairly well, it's quite strong. If you want to get some real strength back into it, get some body filler like Z-Bond or liquid nails even, squeeze that into the, into the slots when open, and then as you close it, you'll be compressing the glue into the corners. Uh, but that's the result. If you persist and try and di with different types of timbers, you can get some magnificent results. Here's how it's done. This is a packing piece, which basically just brings the work closer to you to avoid backache. Uh, it's clamped to the table, and there's the, the cut that you'll be making. This is a little uh, guide, which is adjustable, just made up out of a bit of, bit of sheet metal. And it's adjustable for different spacings of cuts, and what you do, you use the adjuster on the back of your saw, raise the saw blade slightly out of the table. Now, don't leave more than three millimetres of timber connecting or you'll probably break when you bend it. So three millimetres is about your maximum. You'll notice for your very first cut, you've got a problem. You're sitting up on that point. Well, that's easy. Put a spacing packer in behind there for your first cut only and make the cut. Here, it's a good idea to sw switch off the power, lock the trigger of the saw on, and use it this way. And that should form a right angle, as mentioned earlier. Um, the number of cuts for a given thickness of timber never varies. If it's inch and a half, it might be 14 or 15, but once you're satisfied on the number of cuts, it'll be the same for every corner you do. There's a good procedure for converting from a docking saw to rip saw mode, and get into the habit and do it properly every time. You'll notice one thing. I've relocated the power cord for the saw underneath this channel. Now, normally the cord dangles out the back, but you can operate the machine as a docking saw with a cord through here. Just be careful it doesn't get caught at that point there when you're docking. But if you have it under the channel here, you can flip the saw over without unplugging and replugging. The procedure is as follows. Switch off the power. Lock the trigger on, fitting the trigger strap as per the earlier assembly instructions. Slide the saw at the end of its travel. Lift up so that the blade is out of the slot. Unlock the table and slide it out sideways. Blow the sawdust out of the slots and then put the saw in upside down, centralise it between your marks as shown earlier and lower the table on top. Lock it in position, remove the work stops and check that your table is, that your blade is square to the table by use of an adjustable square and adjust the wing nut if necessary. Before doing any ripping, you should follow the test cuts procedure as regards rip sawing, because there are a few very important rules you have to follow. Firstly, never do a free hand rip. You must always follow the fence, and the fence must always be exactly parallel to the blade, and the high side of the fence is closest to the blade in the rip saw mode. In the wide rip mode, you use the low side. Wide rip, uh, normal rip, you use the high side of the fence. Secondly, never feed from the back of the blade, because if you do, 
the, t the blade will pick up the timber and pull it out of your hands very quickly. Thirdly, always use a safety guard when possible. Use a safety guard and lower it so that the timber will just fit underneath it. Always use a push stick, preferably a notched push stick, to push your timber through. Just remember, wood grows again, fingers don't. Then, fourthly, always consider the offcut that you'll be creating and especially an off-cut that's going to be trapped between the blade and the fence. Always try and keep that under control. And one other very important point about ripping, work with a lowered saw blade. Have your saw blade lowered so that it just cuts through your timber. Now that's not only for safety reasons, that's also because it gives you a much smoother, cleaner cut with less, less splintering if you have a lowered saw blade. Now, when ripping, let's say you've got a board like this and you want to rip along that line. Instead of setting the fence in close, for that dimension, set the fence in wide for that dimension and if this is a piece you want to end up with, the wide piece, keep pushing that between the blade and the fence like this. Set the fence to 32 and 232. The fence must always be exactly parallel and double check your settings. That looks right. Notice where my fingers are going to be. Thumb is tucked in, not sticking out. I'm going to keep control of this piece all the way through and keep pushing it right past the back of the saw blade. Lower the safety guard. Don't worry about this piece, it'll fall harmlessly away to the side because it's not trapped. This piece is trapped between the blade and the fence, so keep it under pressure all the time. Now, if you do that cut and you notice that the back of your saw blade is touching against the timber and recutting it or flexing slightly as you push the timber through, it means either your fence was set crookedly or your saw isn't dead square, dead central in the slot, in which case just push your, your fence up against the blade and just make sure that it reads zero in both windows, zero there and zero there. Let's say you're ripping a board and you want it to be absolutely square all along the rip. Well, that's very difficult, as you've probably found by now, because the grain makes the saw blade wander slightly and because the timber's not dressed dead flat on its base and therefore tilts slightly during the cut. Okay, there's a very good way of solving that or minimising the problem. Rip your board a millimetre wider than you need it. Then, having made your first rough rip cut, set the fence in by one millimetre front and back and then pass it through again. This time the saw blade, instead of removing three millimetres of timber with each cut, will just be removing one mil and will work consequently a third as hard and there'll be less likelihood of the blade wandering or the saw angling slightly. So rip oversize and then polish off with a finishing cut. This technique can be used to great effect if you want to clean up some dirty old bits of timber, secondhand timber or painted timber or weather stained or marked or whatever. All you do is you put the timber between the blade and the fence like so and just take a reading of how wide it is before you do the cut uh, that's 87 mil and 87 mil set this say at 85 and 85 lowered saw blade now I'll leave the safety guard off so you can see what's happening here but the timbers the timbers wide enough to me, for me to pass my fingers very safely between the blade and the fence Now, every piece pushed between the blade and the fence will be dressed exactly even, exactly square if the saw blade is set dead square at the table and will come out dressed to size. When you're ripping a longish piece of timber, this is one of the recommended ways of doing it. Now, you'll notice that there's not really enough gap between the blade and the fence for me to pass my fingers safely through there and you must keep control of that piece in there, so prepare your push stick. Okay, notice I'll feed the timber through from the front almost all the way and then pick up the push stick only towards the very end. Okay. 
Okay, if you're ripping a small piece like this, and uh, again, you haven't got enough room between the blade and the fence, use your push stick. Now, if you're feeling insecure about holding it with your other hand, get a piece of scrap piece of particle board like this and form a little tunnel to slide the timber between. You can clamp that down if you wish, but you can generally just hold it. Make sure your tunnel finishes at the start of the saw blade. If you have that too far forward, again, you'll be trapping the offcut between the blade and this other fence here. So have it back there, and this is how you do the cut. Let's repeat that same cut, but this time we're going to create an offcut, which is only about three or four millimetres wide. Now, an offcut that width is dangerous because it can easily fall down between the blade and the slot in the table, and you want to avoid that. Two ways to avoid it. Firstly, reduce that offcut to sawdust by taking two cuts, one at three millimetres and then another one, another three mil further in. So you minimise the chance of a solid offcut. The other way is to do this, and the second way is how you, of course, you make your own veneer if you want to make veneer and again form a tunnel, set the fence in. I've removed the safety guard again so you can see the action. The tunnel stops at the front of the blade. This way, you can break off your veneer and not have an off-cut jam between the blade and the fence. An excellent jig you can make up for repetition ripping, for any sort of ripping really, is like this. A straight piece of timber that custom wood or craft wood is fine. A stop block nailed on with the nails higher than your saw blade will reach and a handle for you to push it. And there's a rebated strip on there, I'll show you how to make that in a moment. But how this works is that sits over your rip fence like that and it's a captivated slide and you put your board in there like this and you can very safely rip a number of strips to exactly the same size and keep pushing them beyond the blade. Again, lower the saw blade like so for the best cut. And every piece you cut will be identical if you do it this way, and unmarked. I'll show you how to make this rebated strip because it highlights a pretty important principle. Now, instead of trying to set the saw blade very, very close to the fence to get that rebate in like that, don't. Do that on the outside of the piece of timber like this. Put a piece of timber in, clock it up against the side of the blade, 70 mil. Now, that wall thickness is about two and a half, so move it in, well, you could almost move it in three mil, give yourself a little bit of clearance. 3 mil and 3 mil. Set the saw blade height appropriately and then your rebate will be done on the outside rather than the inside face of the timber where your blade will be in danger of touching the, uh, touching the fence. Obviously, my timber wasn't terribly parallel, and it varies slightly from end to end, but that's no problem. There's a rebate. Now, all you have to do is part that off. So raise the saw blade, move the fence in, and part yourself off a little narrow strip like that, which you can then nail onto the back of your main guide piece. Make that narrow so you can pass the knobs on the Triton rip fence. Let's say you have to rip a number of very small pieces, very thin pieces down to size. Now you've got a problem there because the timber will want to raise up the saw blade as you're cutting. Okay, you can make a very simple hold down jig like this one. It's adjustable. You adjust it into the fence so that it holds the timber against the fence and then uh, forms a little tunnel there. 
and then you can lower this finger here to hold the timber down and watch the action now I'll walk behind the blade halfway through the cut also notice the distance between the blade and the fence that's about five millimeters that's the lowest you should ever the closest you should, you should ever go to there is a way of taking on less taking off less than five which you'll see shortly Let's say you want to rip a piece of timber that way and your saw just won't cut that deep. Well, you can double rip it, you can end for end it. Instead of doing one very deep cut and one very shallow cut, do two equal cuts to halfway into, into timber. What I'll show you now is uh, how you can double rip and deal with a small offcut simultaneously. See, the offcut I'd be creating will be small enough to fall between the blade and the slot, which you don't want, of course. So, instead of cutting halfway through, I've cut a little bit less than halfway through. Now it's quite safe to hold the timber this way uh, without a push stick because the blade will be buried in the timber at all times. So have a look at this. This way, the off-cut stays connected. That's actually a bit too much of a, of a gap in there, um, but you plane that down. You will need your fine to clean up double-rip cuts a little bit with a plane anyway, uh, because the irregularities in the timber and the grain and any slight discrepancy in your saw blade setting, you'll never get a perfect match anyway, so you may as well leave a little ridge and you can break off an off-cut. If you've got a big off-cut, don't worry about that. Have the saw blade coming through halfway. If you don't want to use your plane to clean that little bit off, just raise your saw blade a whisker and pass it through and do a finishing cut like that. Uh, there are two other ways, three other ways actually, of coping with the problem of an offcut falling down the slot and you'll see them shortly. When you're in the normal rip position with the locking keys and the holes labelled R, then your range of adjustment is from zero out to 260 mil by sighting down through these windows in the rip fence. What happens if you want to do a wider board than that? Well, simply turn the table around like this. The T-shaped holes will be at the back end of the machine, and the keys will go into holes labeled WR, which of course stands for wide rip. Okay, now the fence hasn't been turned around yet, and as you can see, you've got very little lead in, only a couple of inches before you start cutting, and all of this unnecessary tail out. So very simply, just loosen off the clamps, remove the fence, turn it around, and put it back in. You'll notice if you look down through the windows here that the calibration scales have automatically compensated for that distance between there and there. And now you can do a 455 mil rip or 18 inches. And uh, you simply set the fence. Let me set it in a bit further. Again, always set the fence parallel. The safety guard moves along its rod so it can be lowered above the saw blade and have a look at where you'll be pushing the timber. Just raise the blade, the garter whisker. The pressure will be kept on this piece between the blade and the fence. If you regularly have need to rip wide sheets, then this is what you have to do. Make yourself an extension table. Make it flush with the Triton tabletop, and uh, you have to have a fence, a guide, a straight guide, either uh, timber or aluminium, which you clamp on. So give yourself a bit of overhang at the front and back of the extension table. Now, the way you set it is get to know how far from the blade to the edge of the slot, say three millimeters. Always add that on and take a reading from the back edge of the slot. Add on three, of course take a reading from the front edge of the slot and that makes sure your fence is absolutely parallel to the blade because that is very important. Now let's have a look at the construction of this table and you can see a couple of other important things.
make the top of your extension table removable and have a couple of adjustable rails there and at the other end, uh, perhaps with a series of holes and a couple of slots that match up with them so that when you're docking long beams like uh, stud length of 4 by 2 you've got adequate support in a docking saw position or the rip saw position. Also you must attach this extension table to your triton. There's no, it's no good just parking one alongside the other when you're doing a rip cut on a wide board. You can very easily separate the two so clamp it or bolt it to the triton chassis. Before you race in and make one of these, bear in mind that in early 1985 we will be producing an extension table for the Triton which will suit all model Tritons. It'll be uh, probably a lot easier to put together than this one was and uh, will also be collapsible so you can transport it. This obviously takes up a lot of space in your workshop and perhaps you might want to make some temporary arrangements for wide ripping and docking long beams until such time as you can get the extension table from us. Now let's say you've got a very wide sheet and you haven't got an extension table and you want to take say 10 millimeters off this sheet. Now it's quite a tricky cut to do. You may in fact if the sheet's big and heavy enough want to take your portable saw off, clamp a straight edge to your work and run the saw along the straight edge, not using the triton. If you want to use a triton this is how you should do it. Notice the hand position during the cut. I'll always be applying pressure in front of the blade, never beside or at the back of the blade. The pressure's always at the front. And notice also what precaution I take towards the very end of the cut to prevent the off cut, the little piece there, that will be trapped between the blade and the fence, from becoming a projectile. Because that could go flying out like a spear if you're not careful. So this is how you cope with that problem. Well that illustrates the point perfectly. The off cut did go flying, but you'll notice I switched off before I finished the cut. If I'd gone through at full blade speed, that off cut would have flown out ten times as fast. Now another very important point. When you're creating an off cut which is not under control, in other words an off cut that you're not keeping the pressure on, you never stand behind the saw blade. Always to one side. If, if I was standing behind the blade, I would have collected the off cut there, and that could destroy your concentration, could also hurt you of course but could ruin your concentration and you could cause an accident that way. So when there's an, off, an uncontrolled off cut, stand to one side and generally by switching off at the very end of the cut, you can avoid any problems. Let's say you want to take a small amount off a board, say anything from one to five millimeters. Normally, of course, you'd pass the board between the blade and the fence. But if the board's too big to fit or if you've got a lot of pieces of timber, say with a lot of paint on them and you want to clean the paint off, here's how you do it. You should never try to remove a small amount of timber by having the blade close to the fence or touching the fence even. The minimum setting should be about five millimeters, no less than that. The way to do it is to make yourself up some fence packers to screw to your fence and pack it out uh, so that you can get close to the blade with your work. Now, if you've got only a saw, just make yourself up two packers. If you've got a router, make yourself a third packer and that'll be the same as that one. This one's slightly different, I'll explain that now. The, this one was originally the same as these other two, but it was passed between the blade and the fence and one and a half millimetres was dressed off either that face or that face, it doesn't matter which. Take one and a half millimetres off, so that is effectively one and a half mil less than this in width. Screw them to your fence and adjust them in like this. Get a straight edge, put it against your saw blade, just touch it lightly against the blade, make sure it's touching the teeth, not the disc of the blade, but the teeth. Then move your fence arrangement in until the back fence is touching lightly against that straight edge and lock it in position. And just check that the calibrations in the windows are the same front and back. Yes, that's right. Exactly right. And lock the front one in position. Now, because this is a minus 1.5 mil packer, you'll see there's a 1.5 mil gap in there because that's thinner than this one. And now you can dress a large board or many pieces of timber just taking 1.5 mil off of each cut. Because you have fence support in front of your blade and behind your blade, the hand positions are different as you'll see. You'll start off the cut by applying pressure against the front fence 
but then as most of the board comes past the saw blade, you'll end up by pushing against the back fence and actually dragging the board through, like this. Let's say you're planning a job which involves the use of particle board and solid framing timber and obviously as you know you want to cover up that edge of particle board because it doesn't look very good and uh, well it's just not a professional way of joining. A very good way of doing it is to do an edge rebate and this is how you do it. Lower your saw blade, now you can either use an off cut, a sample of the board you'll be using for your tabletop, put that on your table and adjust your saw blade so that the teeth are just level with the, uh, the off cut. If you haven't got an off cut you can find an adjustable square like this is very useful. Set that to the desired height. Sit it on top of your saw blade with the blade touching the tabletop and check the bubble in the window and make sure it's level and horizontal and that'll give you another way of setting up the saw blade height. Having done that, <clears throat> get the same off cut or your square again and set the fence in so that the timber is flush with the teeth, the outside of the teeth here. And then it's very simple to do, to do an edge rebate to take this piece of board. Uh, notice again, there will be a small offcut created. The offcut will be trapped between the blade and the fence. I'll switch off the power at, as I'm completing the second cut. Now, another important factor. When edge rebating, always do your first cut into the vertical face uh, with the timber standing up tall so that when you do your second cut, your timber's lying down on its flat, secure, wide face rather than standing on a precarious edge. You'll see what I mean in a moment. But you basically just do two cuts and flip the timber over and turn it through 90 degrees, like this. You see the way that offcut wanted to fly forward, but the saw was going so slowly it couldn't fly out. Also notice I wasn't standing behind the saw blade, as explained earlier. Okay, that forms a beautiful edge rebate, and it was made for this particle board, so it should be a beautiful drop-in finish. Incidentally, always have your saw blade a whisker above the particle board sample, so that you can still do a bit of sanding on there without rubbing a hole in your veneer if you're using a veneered top uh, piece of particle board. And it's as simple as that to do edge rebating on short or long pieces. If you are concerned about that offcut flying out, there is a safer way of doing your second cut, and that is to reposition your fence and uh, pass it through this way so that the offcut forms ha falls harmlessly to the side. If you need to cover a wide expanse with solid timber, for example, for a bench top or a table top, and you don't want to use particle board, solid planks, you realise you've got a problem, of course, because you can't get timber wider than, say, 10 or 12 inches wide. What do you do? You tongue and groove some boards together. This is how you do it. You set up the blade and the fence to your requirements, as deep as you want to go and as wide as you want to make the tongue. And it's very important that you do the first cuts with the timber standing up vertically, on edge. It's, you'll see why in a few moments. And it's also very important that whatever you do, working off this face, you repeat working off this face. That'll give you absolute centrality for your tongue and your groove. So you must repeat side to side whatever, whatever cut you're doing. This is how you do it. You apply pressure low down here and feed the timber through. The safety guard's not necessary in this regard because the blade won't be exposed. It'll be buried within the timber. Flip over, 
again remove the offcut. And that has given you a perfectly central tongue on the edge of your timber. Now note what would have happened if you had done the two cuts into the flat face first. Then when you're doing the cuts into the vertical face, you would have been sitting on a very narrow edge. And in fact, on certain timbers, that edge might be narrow enough so that you can fall down between the blade and the slot. And that could cause a very nasty accident. So always do your vertical cuts first and then be lying down flat on your secure horizontal face, on your flat face for your second, your third and fourth cuts. To make the groove, all you do generally is move the, the fence out by the distance, the thickness of your saw blade. And in this case, three millimeters, so move it out by three. And move the other end out by three, of course. And lock it in position. You can check it by putting your tongue back in and just seeing if your saw blade teeth come to the very edge of your tongue, which in this case they look like they're doing perfectly. And get your second piece of timber. In case of a wide groove, you'll have to move the fence out again. No, that's a, a little bit too tight. A bit too tight. That's good. You can always open it up. To open it up, put it back on the blade, clock it up again. Using the gauge, press the gauge against the timber, take a reading, 16 mil. Okay, it was a bit, a bit too tight, so move it into about 15 and a half. 15 and a half. And now you can do a shaving cut. Notice, you do a shaving cut to both sides, that side, and then that side to keep your dead centre. And that's actually perhaps a slightly sloppy fit. There's a very good point here. When you're doing, setting up your test cut pieces like this, don't make them too tight a fit. Because what will happen when you're doing your bench top, these pieces won't be short length like this, they'll be very long. They might be two metres long, in fact. Uh, if they're very long, they won't be dead straight. And if you've got too tight a fit on your test cut pieces, you'll never get them together. You won't be able to cramp them up. And the beauty of tongue and grooving, of course, is that they're keyed all the way along the length. And uh, as that timber ages and tries to warp and move and creep, it can't. It's there for life. Let's say you want to tongue and groove a fairly thin board. Uh, well, or, or spline groove, for example. Well, as you'll realise, that's thin enough to fall down between the slot and the table. Here's how you cope with it. Firstly, make yourself a fence extender, a high one, the same height as a board preferably, and make sure that's nice and square to the tabletop. And if necessary, you can pack some business cards or bits, bits of cardboard in behind the fence there to uh, pack it out so it's nice and square. Okay, then get yourself a sheet of masonite or ply or something. Set your fence into the required position, uh, close to the blade for rebating. Uh, raise your saw blade to the height that you want to rebate plus the thickness of this board, whatever thickness that is. And then practice this first to a dummy run, but you'll be plunge cutting that onto the saw blade when it's spinning around. So just get ready, line up. Keep holding it till the blade stops, of course, and then you can just simply sticky tape that down. And uh, you've got, you've covered over the hole in the slot, and you can now run your thin boards through, uh, fully supported all the way, and supported, backed up vertically by this high fence. 
If your board's too thin to tongue and groove it, try just doing a spline groove, rip a, a narrow slot in it, and glue a piece of three millimeter ply in there, and do that to each of your boards, and you'll get a beautiful tongue-like, tongue and groove-like arrangement. Now, the problem with using this piece of scrap ply, which you plunge cut, dropped onto the blade, is that you've got no adjustment of your fence. There is a much better way of doing the same thing. Make up a mask, a mask for your tabletop, which has a slot for the saw blade, um, two slots here and there for the locks of the clamps, and two windows so you can read the uh, scale through the mask. And then you can adjust your fence in and out from the blade. Just be careful of the parallax error that you'll get, because now you've got the thickness of this board here to contend with, so look down directly from above when setting your fence. There's even a third way of achieving the same, the same result, and that is to obtain from our factory two aluminium infill pieces which we can supply to you which you can clamp down inside your tabletop and that'll fill up the slot it's a matter of writing to our factory again the address is on the back panel of the machine now let's say you want to work on end grain or perhaps butt join two pieces of timber together like these pieces see that's just finger grooved together with a couple of thin pieces ripped off and uh, fits together beautifully and tightly the way to do that, of course, is to have your high fence liner because you're running a piece of timber vertically through here and make up one of these. It'll take only a couple of minutes and it's very, very useful. Uh, it just sits on top of the fence liner like that and it's a little pusher stick for you which is captivated on the fence liner and then you get your piece of timber, drop it in and do your two cuts. to clean it up with a bit of sandpaper of course but those two cuts must be perfectly spaced because you did one set one cut from that side one cut from the other side when you're cross cutting uh, per perhaps refer to the test cuts section of the assembly part of this video for the basic principles involved there but just quickly you must have a good even slide and if you haven't uh, the troubleshooters guide will show you how to fix that or you should just try a bit of lubrication there Make a nice easy slide. Now, the way you hold your timber is to hold it against the gauge, thumb behind the gauge, fingers wrapped over the timber, holding the timber quite firmly, and push down on the gauge as you cut. If you're going to be creating a narrow little offcut, say about three or four millimetres, which might fall down between the blade and the slot in the table, then take it off in two cuts. You'll have two loads of sawdust rather than one offcut. But this is a basic action. If you want to cross cut a board which is somewhat wider than you can comfortably fit between the uh, front edge of the, mitre, of the mitre gauge and the saw blade, you can do a plunge cut like this, but you should be very careful in doing this, make sure the timber is well supported, but you can just plunge down. And you can get an even wider cross cut if you remove this aluminium strip and reverse it, poking it out the front of the machine, you'll gain an extra 45 millimetres or so. So that's basic cross cutting. If it's wider than that, of course, you do it in a docking saw position, or if you're handling a long beam, like a piece of 4x2 or a bit of shelving, anything very long and awkward, definitely don't cut it this way, cut it in a docking saw position. This is for small handleable pieces, which you can set the gauge to any angle you wish, and you can cross cut or you can mitre cut, again, gripping the timber fairly firmly and locking your thumb behind and keeping pressure down on the knob. If you want to cut a couple of pieces the same length, then all you do, as in a docking saw position, get the dressed ends dead in line, move them in and cut them in one cut. You can get some spectacular effects on a tabletop, for example, by doing some inlay work. And the way you do it is you set it up in the ripsaw mode, you set your mitre gauge at, say, 15 degrees, and you cut a number of pieces to exactly the same width. Uh, you can, if you choose your grain pattern carefully, uh, timber with streaky grain, you can get some spectacular effects. 
this is how it's done. You set the Triton up in the ripsaw mode. Now there's a natural tendency to set a stop, to set the fence in as a stop, so every piece is the same. But you realise what'll happen there, the piece that you're interested in will be trapped between the blade and the fence, and that, as you know, is bad news. What do you do? Clamp a little block of wood onto the fence as a stop, and then you can butt your piece of timber up against it as a stop. There's only a small amount of contact area there, so there's sm a small chance of sawdust getting in and uh, affecting your cut. Butt it up against there, make the cut there, and then of course you've got this gap in here, so that your offcut isn't trapped. The reason for this inclined piece being taped on behind is just to edge the offcuts away from the saw blade, so that they're not dancing around at the back of the blade and getting recut. And then parquetry is so easy to make. Reverse each second piece, and a little bit of sanding, and you've got a magnificent result. And if you choose your timber correctly, with nice streaky grain, you'll get a magnificent result. You can even alternate dark and light, dark and light, or whatever you wish. You can also mitre cut and get some excellent results in the ripsaw mode, provided the timber's of manageable length. If it's a very long piece of architrave, then of course you do it in a docking saw mode, where you don't move the timber. If it's manageable, set the gauge at 45, and uh, you can preferably use this jig, which you saw how to make in the docking saw section on mitre cutting. Very useful jig this, I'll show you how it works. Again, feed the timber smoothly, and make sure you're pressing down on the gauge as you slide the timber. You'll notice that the saw is cutting down onto the good moulded face, so you won't get any splintering on that face. But this is a, a great way to cut mitres. And there's your reverse angle cut. Notice the use of this little stop block will ensure that every single piece that I cut butted up against that stop will be identical in length. If you want to cut a piece at a very sharp angle, say 70 degrees, then you need to make up this little jig. And notice how the stop block has been reversed. And what you do is you put your timber in, butt it up against the stop, and then feed through like this. This little gauge is also very useful for forming something of a tunnel. If you want to rip a very narrow piece, as you saw earlier, you fit the fence in the stop, in the slots, lock it in, and you can adjust the point of this jig so that it's up close to the front of the blade and holding the timber, forming a tunnel between the end of the jig and the fence. Cutting perfectly central tenons for mortars and tenon joints is very simple on a Triton. All you have to do is make sure that your timber is dressed absolutely square. Set the fence in at, say, 20 millimetres, and lower the saw blade. I'll talk a little further about the height of the saw blade later on when making the mortise. Now, you'll notice as I do this cut that I'm using the tips of the saw teeth to clean up the cut. That's why I've put this piece of packing in here to override the effects of the, of the sandpaper on the front of the gauge, because it's very difficult to slide the timber against the sandpaper. So drop that in, it'll override it. And this is how you make a tenon.
and that way every tenon will come out identical. Now, how wide do you make the tenon? In other words, how high do you set your saw blade above the table? Well, make your tenon so that it's a perfect fit in whatever router cutter size hole you've selected. Select your cutter first, decide how wide it's going to be and make your tenon to suit. That way your mortises only need to be made in one cut and you'll see that in the router, router section. Right, let's say you have to rip a board on a taper. Now obviously you don't do that by angling the saw blade, the, the fence to the blade. You never angle the fence to the blade. What you do is you angle the timber to the blade. And how you do it is like this. You make yourself up a jig, a taper ripping jig, which is two straight pieces of timber with a hinge at that end, a little stop block nailed or glued on to rest your timber against, and an adjustable member at the back so you can vary your angle to do all sorts of tapers. What you do, you set your, saw blade, your fence parallel to the blade, exactly parallel, put the uh, jig on here, put the timber in up against the stop and make the cut. Now it's very helpful when doing this to drop your saw blade right out of position and do a dummy run first and just make sure it's going to be right. But then you can walk around this side of the machine. We've removed the safety guard for visibility purposes. Switch on and make your cut. There you have two pieces ripped on the taper. As you will have seen from the docking saw position, you can cut a 45 degree angle on a piece of timber, but only up to 18 inches wide. Uh, anything wider than that and you, you've got a problem. Now, if you're set up in the rip saw mode and you want to put a bevel on some long pieces, this is how you do it. You make a beveling fence like this. A straight piece of timber, a couple of other straight pieces nailed on at right angles to give you a lip so that you can sit your timber in it. Now everything must be exactly even and parallel and in line. These two little blocks there and there were cut at exactly 45 degrees and make sure they're exactly 45 because I'll dictate the angle that you rip and they're screwed onto the fence and adjusted so that the saw blade is just touching the bottom edge of this piece here. Now you should of course lower your saw blade and do a dummy run first and in fact you'll see what happens when you're feeding the timber through, let's say this is your piece of timber. If you keep pressure on the front face only, then that's okay. But what happens when you get to this point? The timber wants to drop. Okay, so watch the hand movement as the timber goes through and you'll see how to do this cut very safely and very well. Raise your saw blade. Again, the saw blade should only just protrude through the timber. Again, no safety guard because your fingers will be well out of the way. gives you a perfect bevel on a long piece as long as you like. Now let's say you're doing a narrow piece. Well obviously you've got very limited support and in fact you'll be sitting on the saw blade which is a very undesirable situation. Avoid that at all costs. How you overcome it? It's very simple. Get your piece, clamp a straight piece to it exactly at 90 degrees and then holding down here you can slide the whole thing through and make beautiful decorative infill pieces. If you remove your saw blade, you can pick up discs for your saw. They're very cheap, about $4 each or so thereabouts. You can get masonry discs, you can get metal discs and some others as well. If you're cutting tiles, and let's say you want to make a brick pattern tiling job like this with half tiles, what you do is you fit your, your ceramic disc or stone disc to the, tr to the triton, protect your tabletop by using this mask, which you would have seen earlier, how to make this. Lower the disc, have the disc down very, very low, you just want to cut through the glaze and you have to be very careful and experiment with your tiles because different tiles have different tile cutting characteristics but this is basically what you do.
Now, <clears throat> that tile didn't break absolutely cleanly. Uh, you may have to do that in a, in a couple of cuts, raising your disc every time after each cut, and do one cut from the front and one from the back. That often helps prevent fracturing. If you're cutting some quarry tiles or some slate or some sort of tile that shatters badly when you're cutting it in the ripsaw mode, try it in the docking saw mode. Now what you do, put some protection on your table so you don't scratch your paintwork. You can set your fence in as a stop and have one work stop there to support you. Loosen the adjuster on the saw blade so you can raise the disc until it's above the, above the, the tile. And then don't, loose, don't tighten your wing nut or your lever. Leave it unlocked and let the weight of the saw do the work like this in several cuts. And that way you can cut a tile beautifully. For cutting light gauge metal, fit a metal cutting disc to your saw and use it in the docking saw position. You normally don't have to clamp the metal, just hold it down firmly. Uh, a bit of packing under the work will protect your tabletop from damage. And by loosening the blade height adjuster, you switch on and let the saw, the weight of the saw, plus a bit of help from, your own, from yourself, do the cutting like this. If you want to cut some round material, say some doweling or some PVC pipe, and for example at 45 degrees, the best way to cut it is in the docking saw position because then you're not moving the material and there's no tendency for it to twist during the cut. And you do it like this. Put the, tim the material in either square or at 45 degrees, whatever angle you want, and make the cut. One very important point about using discs for cutting metal or ceramics, make sure you're wearing safety glasses, preferably proper wraparound safety glasses or ordinary spectacles. Also, you may want to consider wearing a dust mask and something for your hair because you will create a lot of dust, especially when cutting ceramics. Now, when you're in your hardware store selecting some discs, get yourself an extra one. They're only about $4 each. Glue sandpaper to both sides of it. Coarse on one side, perhaps fine on the other side. And you've got an excellent faceplate sander, just like this. Now, you may find when doing this that you're flexing the disc very slightly, so do your roughing out, roughing out sanding by pressing quite hard against the disc, but when you're ready for your finishing, your, your finishing cuts, just press very gently. You can fit any jigsaw upside down for Triton for contour work in fairly thin material. Now what you do, the jigsaw blade goes through the small square hole in the router plate, and the way you clamp the jigsaw on is you can either borrow the top clamps of your saw, borrow them for the moment and put them on, or you can drill a hole in the top router clamp and put them on. When using the jigsaw in the Triton, you use it upside down in the rip mode, and don't forget to clamp the jigsaw on with a G-clamp, clamp the slide plate so it doesn't move. Now you'll notice that you're losing 23 millimeters of depth of cut, and that will limit the thickness of board you can cut. Normally, 19 mil is about maximum, perhaps up to 25. But if you're cutting fairly thick material, take it very, very slow on the corners and try to avoid very tight corners. When you're cutting, keep your eye on the jigsaw blade and you'll be able to see whether you're twisting it or flexing it from side to side and try to avoid that by just going a little bit slower and taking it bit by bit. Also, get good quality blades. There's a big difference between the cheap blades and the good blades. Get good blades and make sure they're sharp. But this is a general action. You can fit any portable router to the Triton, 
But if you haven't already bought a router, then if you can afford it, get one with a half-inch capacity. The quarter-inch capacity routers will fit, but there's a serious problem apart from the lack of power you get with one of these smaller routers. The length of the shank on the cutters. Now, that's a shank for a quarter-inch router, and it's quite short. It has to be short or it would snap. With a half-inch shank, you can go much longer. So get yourself a bigger router and get long shank router bits because when you're using the router upside down, as you know in the Triton, you'll lose 23 millimeters of depth of cut. Now, the way you fit the router is by positioning it so that the chuck is dead center above the hole in the router plate. It doesn't matter whether your router is skewed, you can certainly move that around to dodge any obstructions on the base of your router. Just make sure the handles don't overhang the plate by too much because that will affect your ability to flip the tool upside down or right way up. But you very simply drill your holes in the router base, clamp the bottom clamps down. If you've got a round base router, you really only need three clamps at about 120 degrees to each other, although you can use four for security. With a square based router, of course, you must use all four clamps. The way the router clamps down is by fitting the top clamp and angling it down at the back there and then tightening the nut. Now this will, of course, force the whole top of the router clamp down at the front and it will clamp with quite considerable pressure. If you're going to be use, using your router upside down a lot, then what we suggest is you replace the wing nuts with ordinary hex nuts and then you can use a spanner and get a nice tight clamp on them. If you've got a lot of obstructions on your router base, like there and there, and you haven't got a good logical spot to fit your clamp, then don't hesitate to modify the top clamp, hacksaw a bit out of it or file it down so it'll fit. It'll still do a very good job of clamping. Now let's say you've got one of the smaller routers and the base is just too shallow for the top router clamp to work properly. Very simply, glue three or four little spacing pieces, little blocks of mace knife, for example, onto the router base and uh, use the clamp bearing down on them. Now, until you become more familiar with the Triton, you may not quite be able to work out when you use the router right way up or upside down. Well, basically, when you're cross-trenching long, wide pieces, especially for shelving or cupboards or so on, then you always use the router right way up with the timber down, lying down flat. Don't try and move a big piece of shelving past a stationary router. It's not the way to go. Lie it down flat. Now, you'll notice that the router cutter won't anywhere near reach your table. Instead of adjusting your table up, use some packing under your router. Remember this platform, this was made for bevel sawing. There's a cut for the, for the saw at 45 degrees. I've made a cut in there with this router cutter. Don't make that cut in one pass, do it in two or three passes because you're putting too much load on the cutter in one hit. And bear in mind another thing, unless you've mounted your router dead centrally above that hole, then that sighting mark won't be in exactly the right spot if you put the router in the other way around and you can operate the router this end facing you or this end facing you, it doesn't matter, but make sure that you always put it in the same way if you want those, the cut to line up with your router cutter, unless of course you've got your router cutter spot on dead center. Now, one other thing about a plunge router, if you've got a plunge router, and they are preferable because they're much faster to adjust, once you've set your router cutter height, tighten up these two nuts. It'll help keep any wobble out of the router. For doing shelving, for example, you get your long boards, put them in. You don't have to mark them all the way through. I've just done it so you can see what, what's happening. And you can line up that end of your mark with the little hole that you've made and do a cut as easy, as easy as this. Now, let's say you're doing a wide trench, like this one, how do you do it? Well, you will notice when using the router on, on some test pieces, that when you're cutting the right hand line, this line here, the router wants to climb up on the work, and you have to actually restrain the router slightly to stop it running away from you. So you do your first cut near the right hand line, but not right on it, like this. 
when you're working the left-hand line, you're doing a feed cut, and that's perfectly easy. You just feed the router, you control the speed of it. You'll notice when you do some overhead trenching with the router that the timber has a strong tendency to move sideways. Now, you have to avoid that. If it's a long piece of shelving, then generally the weight of the shelving might be enough to hold it down. If it's not long and very heavy, G-clamp it down to the Triton table with a G-clamp, or there's an easier way. Make yourself up one or two sandpaper grip boards, which is just a straight piece of timber with sandpaper glued on both sides, and you can drop that in between your workpiece and your fence, and that acts as a very good grip medium. The timber won't move during the cut, uh, it's just with simple hand pressure. Let's say you're rebating a solid piece of timber, not particle board or anything like that, and you want to go down fairly deep. Now, don't make the mistake of trying to go down that deep in one cut. You'll ruin the cut and you'll probably damage your router. Do it in a series of cuts. This way, a plunge router is very good because you can easily adjust the height, but take it in a series of cuts. It'll be a little bit slower, but you'll get a good result. Alternatively, use your saw if you're rebating deeply. Now, let's say you're doing some shelving and you don't want your trenches to go all the way through to the end of the timber. And this is especially the case if you've bought some of that particle board shelving with the hardwood strip on the edge of it uh, for finishing off. Well, here's what you do. You simply clamp a block of wood onto one, one or both the aluminium bearing channels to stop your router's travel. And then you get a stop trench like this. And there's another little hint, too. If you have done stop trenches to stop you breaking through the leading edge, uh, but you want your shelves to come to the leading edge, then all you do is make a little nick in each shelf like that, uh, the top in one corner, and you can drop that in, and you can have your shelf coming right to the end, but it's rebated in. Now, another hint for shelving. If you're doing a big project at home, and let's say you're using 13 millimeter board for your shelves, buy yourself a 13 millimeter cutter. It only costs $20 or thereabouts, but it'll save you a lot of time and effort, and one cut will make a shelf rebate. Let's say you want to put your trenches in on an angle, for example, for a staircase or for louvers, for example. Okay, you can angle the timber against the Triton miter gauge, but you might find that's a little bit small and doesn't give you enough support. Clamp a long straight piece of timber to your Triton table with a G-clamp at both ends. Make sure it's at the right angle. And then, for example, for a staircase, like this one, uh, use a stop block to stop you at the right point each time and just do a series of cuts. Now, you may find when working with long pieces of particle board or with solid timber that there's a bit of a bow in it. Now, of course, if you've got a bow, if you've got a bit of bounce in the middle, if you can push it down a little bit, then you'll find that your rebate will be deeper at that point. How do you eliminate that easily? Cut yourself a couple of spacer blocks, one for each side, and just slip it underneath between the aluminium bearing channel and the timber. It'll hold your timber down nice and flat and won't obstruct your cutting. When using the router upside down, it's very, very important to know the direction of feed. I'll get to that in a moment. Firstly, when you've got it upside down, there's nothing locking the, the, the slide plate in position, so you have to fit a G-clamp or two to the, uh, uh, the slide clamping at the channel. So if you don't have G-clamps, feel free to drill a little 3 16th inch hole in the channel and put a bolt and a nut through. Now, direction of feed. Get a texture pen and mark on the Triton table the direction of feed of the cutter. Put a couple of arrows on so you won't be confused. And the router cutter will always spin around that way. And when those marks wear off, replace them until you're very familiar with the use of the cutter. Because if, for example, you wanted to clean up an edge, say you've been working with melamine board like this, and uh, your saw has left a slightly splintered edge from the cut, which it often does, and you want to clean that up with the router. It's a very good thing to do. But if you were to feed the board between the router cutter, like this, feeding with the direction of feed of the cutter, the cutter will dig into the board and pull it out of your hands very, very fast. That board will become a projectile. So always think out which way to feed from. When you're working on an edge, never feed with the cutter. Always feed against the cutter. Now you might think, well, how can you feed against the cutter? There's two ways. You could either work from the back of the machine, in which case you're feeding against the cutter like that, or you can reposition the fence. Now the Triton fence is quite versatile. 
you can put it in this slot and this slot and lock it in position and get adjustment. You can put it there and there, there and there. You can get almost any range of adjustment by playing around and experimenting with your Triton fence. Just remember, when you're working on an edge, always feed against the cutter. When the cutter is going to be buried in the timber, you can feed with it or against it, and I'll show you that in a moment. Let's say you want to clean up a board. You want to work on that face there. Okay, th these, this is how this, the Triton is set up. The fence, as you can see, is angled across the table the, uh, so that we'll, I'll be feeding against the direction of the feet of the cutter, against it, never with it. And the reason I've put this board on here is to stop any tendency for the cutter to actually move the timber away from the board. So this is actually forming a little tunnel for me. can use a safety guard in there. I won't use it for the moment so you can see what's happening, but always use a safety guard and keep it nice and low. But very simply, also one last thing, don't take off too much of a cut with each pass. Rather, if you want to take three millimetres off, take it off in two bites of one and a half millimetres rather than one of three. And the action is quite simple. Fingers well cleared, do a dummy run by dropping the router cutter if you wish. But switch on. <laughs> If you want to plane the edge of a board that's thicker than your router cutter is high, then this is the way you do it. Again, you'll be working off the back face against the fence, again a tunnel to stop the router from pushing the timber away from the fence, and then you do it in two passes, end, end for ending the timber. Being a high-speed router, it should give you a very smooth finish. Don't feed the timber too quickly. Experiment a little with your feed rates, but you should get a perfect match. Now, let's say you want to do a longitudinal trench on a piece of timber, with the router cutter will be buried completely within the timber, or let's say you want to do an edge rebate, a fairly substantial edge rebate, at least half the router cutter should be buried for this to work properly set up in the way I'm going to show you. Now, you can actually use the direction of rotation of the cutter to your advantage, because the cutter goes around this way, around this way, and it's going to actually push the timber against the fence, so all you have to do is propel it. There's no need when feeding this way to have a little gate, no need to form a tunnel, although you can if you wish, but the router cutter will do the job. Now, I said when doing an edge rebate, you must have at least half the router cutter buried in the timber for this to work this way. If you're doing a very shallow edge rebate, you're running the risk that the router cutter will climb up on the work and pull the piece of timber out of your hands very, very quickly. For setting your fence, uh, there's no importance in having your fence parallel to your cutter. In fact, you can't because the cutter is basically round. Uh, all you have to do is make sure that at the point where the cutter is closest to the fence, like right here, that everything lines up with your desired cut point, and you can turn the cutter around, have a look down from the top and see it. That looks okay. You can fine tune if necessary. Notice now the feeding action. My hands will stay on top of the piece of timber, Never trail a finger or a thumb behind the timber. That's the most common cause of accidents when using a router upside down. Always keep your hands on top and press down firmly. And this is how you do it. Now, there's the first cut, but of course I wanted to do a wider one, so that's okay. Put the timber back in. Readjust the fence, turn the cutter around until the a tooth is pointing outwards as much as possible. Set it up like that, touch the tooth to the pencil line, lock the fence off. Oops. And that way you can do longitudinal trenching on a repetition basis.
Mortising can be very simple on a Triton and you don't need a plunge router to do it. Um, you recall in the tenoning section I, I mentioned that uh, decide first what router cutter you'll be using for your mortise and make your tenon to suit so that you can make your mortise with just one pass of your router rather than one and a bit passes. It'll save you a lot of time and effort that way. How do you set up for a mortise? Well, get an off cut of the piece of timber you'll be mortising, just a small piece. Set it up this way. Again, the router cutter will be turning around this way and pushing the timber into the fence. Sight it up by eye from above. Just look down through there till it's roughly halfway along the timber. Lock off the fence and do a test cut. Do a pl you'll, you'll plunge the timber onto the cutter and move it forward. Um, don't try to go in too deep with one cut. It's a big mistake. Go in in a series of small cuts and this is how you set it up. Now examine that mortise and see that it's nice and central on the piece of timber. If not, readjust your fence if necessary. Once you've got your centrality assured, then you want to work out front and back. And you do that by comparing it to your tenon. And when you've got the start, starting point and the finishing point, make a couple of pencil lines to guide you for further mortises. Or better still, you can clamp a little block of wood on there and a little block of wood on there and that will give you a positive stop. Now, in doing your mortises, as I said, do them in several cuts, not just one very deep cut. And what you should do if you're doing, say, eight mortises, set your router cutter for, a, say, a four or five millimetre cut. Do all eight pieces to five millimetres deep, then raise your cutter, do all eight, the extra five, then so on and so forth. Now, you'll find with your, with your mortises that the router will leave a round end. Don't worry about that. You can, if you're a perfectionist, chisel that square. But basically, a tenon holds on its parallel sides. Now, in fact, rather than chiselling that square, you could round these corners off. That's much easier with a rasp or a chisel. Or you could just ignore it altogether and just make it a nice snug fit on the parallel sides and then your mortise and tenon will fit together beautifully. You'll recall in the rip sawing section in the part entitled Removing a Small Amount of a Large Board, uh, I suggested you make up a couple, two or three fences, fence extenders to screw onto your, mitig onto your triton fence. Now, in this case, for buzzing with a router, you'll use a standard fence and a minus 1.5 fence, for example, that fence being 1.5 millimetres narrower than that one. Screw them to your triton fence and adjust them in until the back fence is in line with the outermost point of the router cutter. Now, turn the cutter around so that that tooth is facing as far out this way as it goes. Adjust your fence in and use a straight edge to actually true up the fence to the router cutter and lock it off. Now you'll notice that there's a gap of 1.5 millimetres in there and that's exactly how much I'll be buzzing off with each pass. Lock that nice and tightly. This is a very useful cut to do if you're making, say, kitchen cabinets and your saw has left a slightly shattered edge, chipped the veneer or the melamine on the edge of your board. It's a great way just rip your boards a millimetre or a millimetre and a half oversize and then buzz off the edge and give yourself a nice, clean, razor-sharp edge. Now, notice the hand position. For the feed-in, while most of the board is against the front, f front fence, I'll be pushing against the front fence. But once most of the board is at the back fence, notice how the hand position changes and you end up by dragging the timber through, pushing it against this fence. And that will give you a razor sharp cut all the way along. If you'll be doing a lot of 45 degree beveling, then invest in a router cutter that's at 45 degrees. And you can get a special cutter from us which has been cut down. It's a nice long flute, cutting flute, to do fairly thick material up to about 23 millimetre thick. And uh, you can use it, where it's been cut down so it'll fit through the triton table comfortably. And this is how you do it. Now, do you recall when you were being advised to make up these two packing fences, uh, I suggested you make up two standard size packers. These are both exactly the same width, uh, not like the minus 1.5 packer you saw a, bit a few moments earlier. Set them up on your fence so that the router cutter is just protruding from them, and then run your board through like this and you'll get a beautiful result.
magnificent edge that the router leaves. A 45 degree router cutter half buried behind two fences like this is great if you want to do some moulding like say chair legs or part of a fence. If you want to make this into an octagonal section it's as easy as this. You may have noticed in those passes that my timber was tend to, tending to get hung up on this fence here when it hit there. For this purpose, put a tiny little chamfer on there, just chamfer that off to give you a nice lead in on your second fence. Just in case you didn't realise what these two cut out, what this cutout is for, these fence packers have been cut at 45 degrees to create an opening for the sawdust to collect in. There's a whole new world of router work that you can get into if you've got decorative bits with a ball bearing pilot or even a high speed steel pilot. Now that's got a ball bearing on it, others, the cheaper ones, have just a high speed steel pilot. Uh, these are better of course, they don't burn your timber, I'll show you that in a moment. What you do here, you don't feed against the fence, this is your fence. But the direction of feed is absolutely critical. You must work against the router cutter. If you work with the cutter, it'll just grab the timber out of your hands and fling it right across the workshop at a terrifying rate. So always work against the cutter, get into the habit of doing it, working against the direction of feed. And it's very simple to do, you just plunge in near a, uh, a little way in from a corner and watch the action as I go around the corners, how my hands move and I'll try and keep the timber in contact with the bit at all times. Notice how I stayed on this side of the router cutter at all times, never on that side. That side, you're going with the cutter, it'll pull the timber out of your hands. And of course, this way you'll get perfect corners every time, and you've got a beautiful result. Now you can do the very self-same thing on a small piece of timber, and I'll show you how. When working on a very small piece, or in this case a piece with sharp corners, you shouldn't try to do it in one continuous pass. This is how you'll do it. Start off on a wider face, keep your fingers well back, but grip the timber quite firmly and you'll see that as I finish that face I'll pass the timber away from the cutter and then re-approach with this edge at the well the, the nine o'clock position if this is a, a clock and that's twelve six three and nine at the nine o'clock position and then feed in like this And that way you can do even small decorative pieces which you of course can't do with a handheld router. There are a couple of traps for the unwary when using a pilot bit. For example, this piece of timber has a knot right there and of course what's going to happen is the ball bearing will drop into that knot and give you an undesired little scallop there, ruining your cut. Let's say your timber is bevel cut like this. Of course, as you get towards the end of that cut, you're gonna suddenly run out of support and have a look at what will happen. And of course that's ruined the piece of timber. How do you cope with either of those eventualities? Well, very simply, get your triton fence, put it in position, and don't feed against the ball bearing, feed off the back face of the timber. Feed it that way and you'll have no problems. Let's say you want to route a piece of timber, but you don't want to go from end to end. You just want to start your route there, for example, and finish it there. Well, your problem is this. You have to plunge in, plunge the timber onto the cutter, 
If you plunge in too far back from that line, then in approaching that line, you'll be feeding in the same direction as the router cutter, and of course the router will want to kick the timber out. So plunge in very close to that line, as close as you can, and restraining the timber quite firmly, inch it close to the line, when you reach that line, then you can start your push through, like this. If you want to follow a curved edge and put some router decoration on it, then you must use a ball bearing cutter like this and uh, very simply hold the timber in contact all the, all the way. If you've got a number of these pieces to make at, the, for the, at exactly the same size, there's a very easy way of doing it. You make up a template out of some masonite, for example, which is slightly smaller than the piece you want. You'll have to have a half-inch capacity router for this. Most of the half-inch capacity routers have a template following guide with them. You may have to extend the height of the lip on the guide. I've just put a bit of aluminium tubing over it, a nice squeeze fit. Uh, you have to extend that to pass through the Triton table, but with the masonite template nailed onto your piece of timber and a straight router cutter, preferably a fairly narrow diameter one, about six or eight millimetres, you can follow the template, follow the masonite along that edge there and the router will do the work of cutting out your shape as long as the timber isn't too thick, no more than say an inch thick or 19 mil inch dressed. If you have one of the smaller routers with a quarter inch capacity and you're not prepared to upgrade to a half inch capacity router, you'll probably find that your router bits are too short in the shank to use them, especially with a decorative cutter like this one, to use them upside down because of the thickness of the Triton table. There is a solution you can adopt. And that is to make yourself up a false top out of some six, eight or 10 millimeter thick material. Uh, you'll have to relieve it at the point where your bolt, bolt heads come through the router plate and hold it down to the router plate with a couple of countersunk screws. Make sure you've got a little bit of overhang on either side so you can still clamp a fence on, a guide. You don't need calibrations, as explained earlier, because the router, you just measure the fixed distance between the cutter and the fence. Now, this cutter that happens to be in this small router hasn't got a ball bearing on the front. It's just got a high-speed steel boss, and that can give you this result. You can burn the timber quite badly. As you can see, especially on end grain, because that's spinning at about 23,000 RPM. That's why you should have ball bearing type cutters. You've got a ball bearing on top, it'll eliminate any burning that you might get along the edge. Now a general wrap up on some of the safety precautions you should take when using the Triton. Firstly, always wear eye protection. Wrap around safety glasses are the best, of course, but spectacles will do. But a speck of dust in your eye during a cut can cause you to ruin the cut and can cause a nasty accident because you lose concentration. Always try to work in a well-lit and uncluttered environment. Keep any off-cuts off your table. Don't leave your square lying about on the table. It may vibrate into the blade. Thirdly, always fit the safety guard. Use it whenever possible and adjust it so that it's just above the timber and the timber can just safely slide underneath the guard and lock it in position. Fourthly, use push sticks when ripping. When ripping narrow pieces, use a push stick, but preferably, of course, make up some of the jigs you've seen in this video. Especially this one for ripping uh, narrow pieces, that's a very useful jig. Also for mitre cutting, you'll find this one very, very useful indeed. If you want to do some buzzing and planing, these two fences for the router or saw are excellent. So make up these jigs, They'll only take a few dollars worth of material and you can knock the whole lot of them up in a couple of hours and they'll save you a lot of effort and give you excellent cuts for the next few years to come. Before doing any cut, go through a mental checklist. Firstly, are your fingers clear of the blade? Will they be clear of the blade at all points during the cut? Secondly, is the timber, the workpiece, well supported before, during and after the cut? And thirdly, have you taken the off-cut into consideration? Is there a danger that the blade will recut the off-cut? or perhaps even fling it out of the machine at high speed.
most accidents that occur when using radial arm saws or ripsaw benches are where the offcut is involved, where the offcut has been recut or flung out. So always think about it, consider what offcut you'll be creating. When doing an unfamiliar cut, it's a very good idea to simply drop the saw blade out of position or the router cutter, drop it right down, and then mentally go through the whole cut, do a dummy run, and make sure that everything's okay. For example, make sure your push stick will fit between the blade and the fence, and rehearse it, and then put your blade back in position. Remember, only have your blade sticking up so it'll just cut through the timber if you're using it in the rip saw mode. It's also a good idea to test on a scrap of the timber you'll be using if you've got a spare piece that you don't need for the job because there's nothing more frustrating than to have selected some good timber for a job and then to ruin it on your first cut because you haven't tested it. So try and do a test cut on a piece of scrap. Don't force a blunt blade or a blunt cutter to do its work. It won't do it properly and you'll wear out your tool much faster. Get them sharpened. Tungsten carbide tip blades and cutters can be sharpened at quite reasonable cost. Be careful with your tungsten tipped blades and cutters. While tungsten is very, very hard to keep its nice sharp edge, it's also brittle, so don't knock them around and keep your cutters in their plastic pouches, very important. Also get your power tools serviced occasionally. Take them in every couple of years and get them checked over for bushes and arbor float and so on. Finally, disable the triton when you're finished working for the day. Three things you ought to do. Firstly, release the trigger strap. Don't leave that lashed on. Unplug the power and release the safety guard, undo the rubber band. On some swords, you'll have to lift them and let it swing home. Remember, while you may know how to use the Triton, your children don't and perhaps your friends don't and they may get access to your workshop. And in the case of children especially, one of the first things they'll do if they get into your workshop is pull the trigger or switch on at the switch because they've seen you do it, no doubt, many times. So disable your machine and leave it in a condition where nobody can hurt themselves if they accidentally switch it on. We have a very strong company policy that our obligation to you, our customer, does not end when you buy your Triton. Apart from your normal warranty, we stand by our product and we'd love to help you if you're having a problem. For example, if you're not getting the desired results in any particular mode of operation, and if you've studied the video and studied your instruction manual and still can't find a solution, we'd love to help you. All you have to do is ring us or write in, tell us your serial number, tell us what the problem is, and we'll try to help you. If your problem is that you've run out of ideas on what to make, then stay tuned, folks, because later this year, 1984, or early next year, we'll be producing a very useful project book listing hundreds of items that you can make and how to make them. We're also planning some project videos, more of them along this, these lines, but specific project videos. And a future plan is for a Triton Owners Club, where there'll be regular newsletters and uh, passing on hints, information, tips, project information, product information, new accessories and so on. And we may even try to arrange workshops where Triton owners can gather in the major population centers, get together, swap ideas, learn more about their, their, their machines and generally become more competent woodworkers. How do you get to know about these future developments? Well, it's easy. If you haven't already filled in your warranty coupon, fill it in and send it back to us. That automatically puts you on our mailing list. If you've lost the coupon or mislaid it, then simply jot down your name, address, your work number, your home number, and your serial number of the machine if possible, and ask us to put it on the mailing list, send it in to us, and we'll notify you of future developments. Finally, if you are delighted with your Triton, and we sincerely hope you are, please tell your friends and your workmates about it. The more you do for us in this regard, the more we can do for you. Happy Tritoning.